order. I will have prepared remarks in a moment. First, a brief comment on this morning's breaking news. This morning, there appears to be a massive, unauthorized disclosure of taxpayer records. The source of this information is unclear. Given the IRS's responsibility to protect taxpayers' data, it has a responsibility to investigate the source of this disclosure. In the meantime, as reported by ProPublica, what this data reveals is that the country's wealthiest, who profited immensely during the pandemic, have not been paying their fair share. I'll have a proposal to change that. Now, with respect to today's hearing, the Finance Committee welcomes Commissioner Reddick to discuss the President's 22 uh, 2022 budget request for the IRS. The commissioner knows well that this committee's interest in closing the tax gap, improving enforcement, and fighting the unfairness in our tax laws is a special priority of this committee. That starts, in my view, by going after cheating by the big guys at the top. A few key examples, starting with wealthy taxpayers who skip filing their tax returns altogether. According to a 2020 report from the Inspector General for Tax Administration, nearly a mil million wealthy taxpayers failed to file returns between 2014 and 2016, dodging a total of $46 billion in taxes. Tax season came and went. They disappeared from the radar. Senator Whitehouse and I insisted on some explanation. Two weeks ago, he and I got a letter from the Internal Revenue Service that said that the agency sought charges against only 200 taxpayers for failing to file a return over a period of six years. Something is way out of whack here, colleagues. On the one hand, you've got a fortune going unpaid by wealthy individuals who essentially blow off the responsibility they share with every other American taxpayer. On the other hand, only a couple hundred non-filers are facing charges. You would think that the IRS would be aggressively following up on the affluent non-filers, but the evidence just doesn't show that that's the case. Here's a second example of high earners escaping real scrutiny. More than two out of every three dollars earned by partnerships in this country goes to the top 1% of earners. These are sophisticated entities that bring in big revenue. However, the most recent data shows that out of millions of partnership returns filed in 2018, only 140 were audited. If you're a wealthy cheat in a partnership, your odds of getting audited are slightly higher than your odds of getting hit by a meteorite. It's an audit rate of 0.00004%. On the other hand, taxpayers who claim the EITC have been much more likely to get audited. Again, something just is out of whack with respect to enforcement. For the sake of fairness and for the sake of the budget, it makes a lot more sense to go after cheating by the big guys than focus on working people. The President's budget proposal has a lot to say on those issues. With funding increases for enforcement personnel and information technology, it would help to build up the IRS's ability to handle the premier cases, which is tax evasion by the wealthy. At the same time, it's important to recognize that there's history here. And the history is that the IRS has a history of going after the little guy too often. The budget proposes expanding the information that major financial institutions must report about some client accounts. It is absolutely critical that the focus of that information reporting be on the wealthy tax evaders. The budget also includes, includes a proposal that's been a big priority for this committee for a long time, the authority to regulate paid tax preparers. 
Too many Americans who need help filing their taxes are falling victim to fraudsters and incompetent individuals. Taking a smart approach to creating rules in this area will help lots of people avoid a tax refund nightmare, particularly those of modest incomes who depend on their refund every spring to make ends meet. So there is a lot for this committee to discuss. I want to thank uh, Commissioner Reddig for joining us. I look forward to the discussion. And uh, let's hear from our friend, Senator Crapo. Thank you, Senator Wyden. And, and uh, like you, before I begin my formal statement, I want to comment on the, the ProPublica information that came out today. Uh, essentially, as the chairman has said, uh, we are seeing information today that appears to be uh, 15 years worth of leaked confidential individual tax data from the IRS. Uh, we don't know the details of, of what happened here yet or not, but this information today uh, is very relevant, in my opinion, to some of the proposals that the administration has uh, on the table to expand the IRS's access to data on people, not just to their tax filings, but uh, for individuals and companies um, to have their data in, in financial institutions uh, open to access from the, to the IRS. And, and these, are, these are issues that are very significant and, and require resolution. As to my formal statement, again, Mr. Chairman, I thank you and Commissioner Reddick for joining us today. It's safe to say that we all support efforts to administer our nation's tax laws and collect taxes that are legally due. Today we will hear from Commissioner Reddick about proposals to massively increase the budget at the IRS aimed largely at increased compliance and enforcement efforts. Commissioner Reddick, you have the chance to provide your perspective on an array of issues, including any updated tax gap analysis your agency is preparing, various compliance or enforcement related proposals contained in the President's budget and recently enacted spending programs that the IRS will soon begin implementing. Focusing on the administration's discretionary funding request for the IRS, I look forward to hearing about how the IRS would spend the $1.2 billion in additional funding in fiscal year 2022, including the specific activities that the funds would go toward and what the expected outcome from these activities will be. The President's FY 2022 budget proposes not only a significant increase in IRS funding, but also a dedicated mandatory flow of funding for the IRS over a 10-year period, based partly on some speculative and questionable assumptions and analysis. Multi-year guaranteed appropriations like this are rare, and it's important to understand whether the circumstances actually warrant it. It's also important to understand how much additional funding the IRS can efficiently use as well as the specific implementation plans the IRS has to put any additional funding it receives to good use. Much has been said about the decline in IRS funding from the 2010 fiscal year. Less has been said about data suggesting the IRS has become at least somewhat more efficient in the aftermath of these declines, such as the fact that the IRS gross revenue collections have increased every year year over year since 2010, from $2.34 trillion in 2010 to $3.56 trillion in 2019. Further, the IRS's costs of collection have decreased every year, year over year since 2010, from $0.53 cents in cost per $100 collected in 2010 to $0.33 cents in cost per $100 collected in 2019. Moreover, we need to better understand the actual correlation between the IRS's enforcement budget and the enforcement revenue it collects. For example, IRS data shows enforcement revenues actually increased between fiscal years 2012 to 2013, 2013 to 14, 2015 to 16, 2016 to 17, and 2017 to 2018, despite actual enforcement spending decreasing in each of those periods. Similarly, between fiscal years 2019 and 2020, enforcement revenues declined by $6.4 billion, despite actual enforcement spending increasing by $317 million. Suffice it to say, we need to better understand the facts at play here, particularly before we rush to adopt multi-billion dollar funding increases. And as we all know, revenue comes from the economy 
and revenue collected is far more sensitive to the state of the economy than it is to the size of the IRS budget or the scope of its enforcement. When the economy grows, revenues rise, and when the economy shrinks or grows sluggishly, revenues fall or grow slowly. The administration's budget proposes several new reporting, compliance, and enforcement regimes, including a proposal to require near universal disclosure to the IRS of gross inflows and outflows for both traditional and non-traditional financial accounts for businesses and for individuals, as well as for third-party settlement entities. I've long been a critical person, I've, I've long been very critical of big data collection activities and oppose turning banks and brokers into government tax collectors and have strong concerns about proposed IRS big data requirements. According to the budget request, and I'm quoting, this requirement would apply to all business and personal accounts from financial institutions, including bank loans and investment accounts, with the exception of accounts below a low de minimis gross flow threshold of $600, or fair market value of $600. Commissioner Reddick, you may recall that expanded 1099 information reporting was enacted in the Affordable Care Act to include any payment over $600. And the American people soundly rejected that provision, leading to its rapid repeal a year later. Absent bipartisanship in developing enhanced compliance and enforcement activities and public acceptance of their legitimacy, the administration's proposals will not be durable. The key issue for the IRS and for those of us who oversee it is to strike the appropriate balance between rigorous enforcement of the tax laws and heavy-handed stifling intrusiveness. I'm concerned about the implications of many of the President's budget proposals, including requiring additional and highly burdensome information reporting when some existing reporting is duplicative and much is still not being utilized to the fullest extent. Proposals to increase compliance and enforcement can have merit, but there is risk of turning the IRS and perhaps even private financial institutions into feared gatherers of information that is not necessary for tax administration and in my opinion, violates the privacy of Americans. Also, in regard to compliance, I'd be remiss if I didn't indicate my continued disappointment in the lack of responsiveness of the IRS and Treasury to my inquiries. You last appeared before this committee on April 13, Commissioner Reddick, and I've yet not received responses from you to questions that I asked for the record. I also sent you a letter on May 10 with a series of questions about the speculative and questionable tax gap projections that you have recently put forward. I only received a partial response to my questions late yesterday afternoon. It is somewhat surprising for the administration to request outsized and mandatory funding for the IRS while at the same time not complying with basic transparency and accountability responses, responsibilities. Commissioner Reddick, I look forward to your testimony, and I do thank you for appearing here before us today. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank, thank you, Senator Crapo. Commissioner, please proceed. Chairman Wyden, Ranking Member Crapo, and members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to discuss our proposed budget for fiscal year 2022, our efforts to help taxpayers, especially during the COVID-19 pandemic, and our ongoing efforts to address the tax gap. Before I begin, I want to thank Congress for recognizing the efforts of our employees during the pandemic on behalf of the country. We are proud to serve our country and want to provide meaningful services of a nature and quality every American deserves. The problems facing tax administration are, today are not new. It will take time to overcome the challenges of the past and without adequate, consistent, timely, multi-year funding, the agency will continue to struggle to replace more than 50,000 employees expected to be lost through attrition over the next six years, expand and train our workforce, and support implementation of our multi-year integrated business modernization plan. The Taxpayer First Act, and as well as continuing to enhance both meaningful service and compliance efforts. Like all federal agencies, the IRS is best suited to provide the services Americans deserve and appropriately enforce the tax laws in support of compliant taxpayers when it receives the resources it needs to do so. 
At a time when the IRS has faced consequential resource challenges, it has also been called upon to take on new significant responsibilities. I believe that our response to the unprecedented COVID challenges illustrates the importance of every American to the IRS and the importance of the IRS to every American. During the pandemic, in a bit more than 14 months, IRS and Treasury employees delivered more than $800 billion through more than 474 million payments in three rounds of economic impact payments, including refunds for tax year 20, for uh, filing season 2020 and so far filing season 2021. The IRS and Treasury have distributed more than $1.3 trillion. Turning to the 2021 filing season, I'm pleased to report that the filing season has generally gone smoothly. On, the, on filing date, May 17, we received a record of 15.36 million returns. Through May 28, the IRS has processed more than 137 million individual returns, including 101 million refunds, totaling more than $281 billion. We are working through backlog <clears throat> in returns, but we are current as to all returns received by us during calendar year 2020. Our error resolution system currently has about 9.4 million returns in process, which are principally due to inconsistencies between reconciling amounts of EIPs received for the return recovery rebate, EITC claimants claiming with respect to 2019 versus 220, and identity theft. We are working through these using mandatory overtime for our employees and exercising every effort that we can. We are also current in opening mail. We receive between one and one and a half million pieces of mail per week. All of the mail is opened within a week of receipt by the Internal Revenue Service. In 2021, we received more than 150 mil million phone calls, and at peak, we're receiving calls at the rate of, one of 1,500 per second. Between live and automated systems, we answered more than 36 million calls, and we've had more than 1.4 billion visits to irs.gov. We are on track with respect to implementation of the statutory requirements for the advanced child tax credit with the first payments to be received July 15. More than 30 million households and more than 65 million children will be receiving monthly payments beginning July 15. We will soon launch the online tools and we invite members and staff for a demonstration of our CTC online tools which include a non-filer tool that will soon be launched, a, CIT, a CTC update tool that will be launched by the end of June, eligibility tool, and other relevant information. We have been doing outreach, including recently distributing more than 30 million letters to potentially um, eligible individuals. Congress can help us in our efforts by providing direct hiring authority and consistent, timely, multi-year funding sufficient to us to provide meaningful services on behalf of every deserving American. You've referenced the President's fiscal year 2022 budget proposal, which has three critical components. The discretionary budget request of $13.2 billion, a 10.4% increase above the 2021 enacted level, and two other portions which are intended to build back the IRS, the Program Integrity Allocation Adjustment, and the American Families Plan. These streams, we believe, are important. We are willing, as Treasury is, to meet with members and staff to discuss them. And ultimately, we will do our best with the funding that Congress provides. And we realize, and you realize, that we are a tax administration agency, and we will try. So, Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member, with that, I invite questions, and thank you for having us up here today. Thank, thanks very much, uh, Mr. Reddick. Let me start with this uh, Treasury Inspector General for Tax Administration report that showed that 900,000 high-income taxpayers dodged $46 billion in taxes by failing to file returns between 2014 and 2016. When we asked about the legal consequences, your office replied in a May 25th letter that the IRS asked the Department of Justice to charge 200 taxpayers for failing to file a return between 2014 and 2020. Everybody else appears to have just gotten away with not paying the taxes that they owed. So let's start by having you explain why so few persons were charged with failing to file a tax return 
over the past six years when the inspector generals and others are saying tens of thousands of high flyers got away with shirking their duties. Every high-income non-filer from tax year 2016 forward is involved in compliance action with the Internal Revenue Service. The reference that you're referring to is under 7203, which is a misdemeanor for a failure to file an income tax return. And the, the statistics you have are statistics that we provided. There have been legislative proposals, even recently, about making a multi-year non-filer um, matter a felony as opposed to a misdemeanor. The system is not designed to um, effectively address misdemeanors. We have limited resources in our criminal investigation function. Decisions had to be, have to be made based on resources. The same people in criminal investigation who are spectacular at what they do that would look at misdemeanor cases and, and the majority of misdemeanors in the Department of Justice, if they bring those cases, that's their decision to indict. If they bring those cases, the majority of those cases, the individual it does not receive a period of incarceration. The majority of the felony cases that are brought, people receive a period of incarceration. The incarceration is not only a deterrent to the individual who ends up in prison, but it's also a deterrent to other similarly situated taxpayers. Let, let, let's stay with We the, share your concerns, Senator. Let, let's stay with this question of how the wealthy always seem to be able to skip out on their obligations. In 2018, the IRS audited 140 partnerships. By my math, that's less than 0.00004% of the 4 million partnership returns filed that year. So you got a better chance of being struck by lightning than being audited if you're a partner in a partnership. And this is exceptionally concerning given that around 70% of all partnership income accrues to the top 1% of households. So this is another example of the tale of two tax codes. You've got the nurse in Medford, Oregon, this morning, treating COVID patients. They pay taxes with every uh, paycheck. But if you're a millionaire who can arrange their assets through a sophisticated, complex web of partnerships, you can abuse the system essentially with impunity. And I'd like to know what you're going to do to have um, a significant reform in this area, enforcement of large partnerships, because I think that is key to my proposition, and that will be the heart of my proposal. It is the heart of my proposal to ensure that the wealthy pay their fair share. Can so explain to me how you intend to deal with this significant gap in tax fairness. We share your concerns. Our highest rates of attrition are at our most specialized senior examiners. The president's budget, not only under the discretionary budget, which has funding for enforcement and services, but under the uh, PIA, as well as the mandatory provisions, specifically provide for increased resources, specialized agents looking at partnerships, wealthy individuals, corporations, and I believe that it was at this hearing in April, um, if I'm not mistaken, where I indicated that in those arenas, we are outgunned, that uh, the, the resources outside the service on a particular case, more often than not, far exceed the resources we are able to devote. And out of 4.2 million partnership returns, we cannot touch 4.2 million when service-wide, I have 6,500 field revenue agents and I need to deploy those so, as best we so can. So just tell us for the record, with the added money for enforcement, and that's going to get my support, how much of an increased effort will you direct to these very wealthy partnerships where there just hasn't uh, been the uh, focus and the scrutiny that enforcement requires? Our enforcement focus, and I need to address also that the, the budget also involves funding, and in the discretionary part of the budget, the most significant increase is in taxpayer service and modernization. But speaking to the enforcement point, which is what we're addressing here, our specialized agents that we're looking to bring on board, and it's a significant hiring for us, and it's at three separate levels. We're not just hiring under five-year um, if we receive the budget, under five-year people, we're looking at that category of individuals. We're looking at mid-career people in their 30s and 40s who have a degree of experience. 
And we're looking for people at my level who also have a degree of experience who can not only um, instruct our people but can work these cases from the moment they come on board. But our focus is on, and I have the list if, you, if I have a moment and I could provide it to you, sir. Our focus is on high net worth individuals, global high wealth, large pass-throughs, the largest pass-throughs, large corporate compliance, the ultra-large corporate <coughs> compliance, employment tax field examinations, employment tax com correspondence examinations, and I'm finishing, transfer pricing, non-filer virtual currency, Bank Secrecy Act, Forms 8300, and abuse of transactions, both promoters and taxpayers. And that's our list that we are requesting the ability to bring on specialized agents to, to make a determination. I, I, I would like in writing some additional detail about how you intend to focus in those areas, all right? We would be pleased like, to I'd, I'd, I'd like that within a week because we're going to be moving pretty quickly on these issues. Senator Craig. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I'm going to follow up on the same general topic, but from a different perspective, Commissioner Reddick. Uh, I, I completely agree that we need to make sure that those who fail to pay taxes do are identified and forced to pay the tax that they owe and pay the necessary penalties for tax avoidance. Uh, that being said, uh, the President's budget calls for a new change in the law allowing the IRS to have what I see as near universal access to the reporting of Americans' financial account information to the IRS, transactions over $600. Uh, this proposal will carry with it a significant amount of privacy concerns, in my opinion. Uh, like I say, I don't have a problem with helping the IRS get stronger ability to focus and uh, specialize in dealing with these wealthy individuals, partnerships, and corporations who are avoiding tax owed under the law. But I don't think that Americans would support giving up their access to their own private financial information to the IRS or to any government agency. And today's results, the, the, today, the information we got today in the ProPublica circumstance uh, is just evidence of why Americans, I think, are going to be very concerned about giving the IRS direct access to their financial data. The question I have for you is, do you believe that the American people support having their banks effectively act as IRS agents and report on, quote, flows of deposits into or withdrawals from their checking and savings accounts that amount to more than $600? Uh, as a tax administrator, it's probably not appropriate for me to comment upon what I believe, but, you know, we, we see the media reports uh, going in both directions. The information reporting does get provided to the Internal Revenue Service in the event of an examination. It's one of the first things, obviously, that, that agents request, and they can request informally and formally. And in part, I think that there's a strong belief that um, modernized systems and the ability to actually use the information that we have and would receive will help us not, it'll lessen the burden on some taxpayers by having us not audit certain taxpayers and maybe streamline the examinations of others. But, you know, as I said, ultimately, we're tax administrators and we will implement to the best of our ability what Congress approves. Well, Commissioner, I, I've been working for years, and I believe Senator Wyden has too, on, on privacy on the Internet. I think that people have a right to privacy of their data, and I don't mean just financial data, but their activities on the Internet and uh, the data collection that private sector companies are collecting on Americans now is phenomenal. And I think Americans are fed up with it. And I, th I think that this proposal to, to literally increase the IRS ability to, in my opinion, violate the privacy and access the private financial information of individuals in a manner that is far in excess of what currently exists uh, is of great concern. How can the IRS assure Americans that the information it would receive under this proposal would be used for proper purposes, and in light of the ProPublica uh, re information we report we saw today, uh, how can it protect people from that kind of, of uh, violation of their own privacy? The IRS is one of the largest um, data warehouses in the world presently, and the IRS has significant um, 
you know, I, I can't speak to the ProPublica article as I think we have discussed. I can't speak to anything with respect to specific taxpayers. Um, I can confirm that there is an investigation with respect to um, the allegations that the source of the information in that article came from the Internal Revenue Service. Uh, upon uh, reviewing the article, the appropriate contacts were made as you would expect. And um, the investigators will investigate and ultimately that will be there. But we also have, as you know, very strong Inspector General in TIGTA, the um, GAO, we have a taxpayer advocate who the purpose that came in in the 90s was to provide oversight and be in-house in the IRS and uncover if there are issues that need to be you know, uncovered and dealt with. So you know, we will find out about the ProPublica article, but we do have quite a few systems in place. And I would say for the volume of data that we have and that gets exchanged, I think the IRS has been very successful in uh, protecting that data, but we're not insensitive to your comments, sir. Well, thank you very much. My time has expired, so I'll, I won't ask, uh, I got a number of additional questions that I will submit for the record. Uh, but I do want to let you know that I'm going to follow up on the letter we received from you yesterday with regard to your analysis of the tax gap. I think that we need to get much deeper into that. And at, for all members, I'm available for one-on-ones. Members of our staff are available for one-on-ones with members or with your staff. I'm available to meet with your staff. Thank you. Senator Grassley. You just answered my first question when you said that you're investigating this ProPublica uh, release of uh, secret IRS files. I assume that, uh, that uh, if your investigation finds a violation of law, you're going to see that people are prosecuted. Is that right? Absolutely. I share the concerns of every American for the... Um, sensitive and private nature and confidential nature of the information the IRS receives. As you all are well aware, I spent 36 years on the outside. I think that trust and confidence in the Internal Revenue Service is sort of the bedrock of asking people and requiring people to provide financial information. And uh, we have, as I said, turned it over to the appropriate investigators, external and internal. Uh, after the April 13th hearing we had, uh, I submitted written questions to you regarding the IRS's administration of the private debt collection program and its implementation under the Taxpayer First Act. However, I have yet to receive a response. Uh, when should I expect to receive a response to that, that letter? Sir, as you know, um, I'm a huge proponent of private debt collectors. I think that they've been a significant uh, help for the Internal Revenue Service, as well as we often have discussions about whistleblowers and where we're headed. I see whistleblowers as a critical component of the future of the IRS. The, um, the uh, question, responses to the questions for the record uh, ha are in clearance. They're outside of my immediate domain, if you will, so I would anticipate soon. Um, we have pushed to get those released to you um, and, and I don't take lightly the concept that um, for the ranking member that we released a letter to him last night. I get it that that's not sufficient time to look at a letter to sensitize and, and have follows up. And same with the QFRs. You should have received them before today. I, I will only comment that internally and in the clearance process, which is outside of the IRS, um, People are pushing really hard. It's not an excuse, sir. It's an explanation. But the, the shorthanded answer is soon, and I am trying to be on top of that to get that information to you. Okay. It's not without lack of attention, um, if you will, sir. Last month, the Inspector General for Tax Administration released an updated report on improper payment rates for refundable tax credits. The report indicates the IRS continues to struggle to meaningfully reduce improper payments for refundable credits. Yet, according to the report, IRS and Treasury have requested the Office of Management and Budget to exempt refundable credits from improper payment reporting requirements. This comes at the same time that the current administration is seeking massive expansion of several refundable credits. Why would the IRS and Treasury seek to limit information available 
to Congress to evaluate these credits and their proposed expansions? I don't think it's limiting of information available to Congress. I think it's more in terms of the accounting and the internal accounting and would be pleased to follow up with you. The figures will not go away. Those figures are significant, as you're aware if you've seen the report. Um, with respect to EITCs, the rate is about 25%, about $17 billion per year. CTC, it's about 15%, uh, 4.5, uh, 12%, excuse me, $4.5 billion per year. We, there have been proposals on, on the credits to essentially merge credits, make them more administrable by the Internal Revenue Service into something maybe along the orders of a family credit where the IRS can rely on information in its systems. We do not have, for these refundable credits, we do not have information as to, say, the residence of a dependent and such, and it makes it extremely difficult to administer those in the ordinary sense. So um, I will follow up with you in terms of the background for that, but it's not to prevent Congress. I'm, I'm a huge believer in, in your oversight, this committee and others, a huge believer in transparency, and a huge believer that you are a meaningful part of tax administration with us on behalf of this country. So um, there is no intent or incentive or desire to withhold information. To the contrary, we need you. Okay, I'm going to have to submit my other questions for answer in writing, but the important one to, to answer in writing is in regard to tax administration saying that there's improper payment rates of 20 seven and four tenths percent, the highest rate of any credit when it comes to the premium tax credit. So I'd like to have you look at that. Uh, thank you. Thank my colleague, uh, Senator Menendez. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Commissioner, let me start off by thanking the dedicated employees at the IRS. I uh, hope you'll share that with them, especially for their tireless work during the last year to get stimulus checks into the hands of hardworking Americans. Uh, Thanks to the American Rescue Plan, 27 million children nationwide and more than 1.6 million children in New Jersey uh, are estimated to benefit from the historic expansion of the child tax credit. So, Commissioner, given the issues with the stimulus payments last year, how is the agency working to ensure that all taxpayers who are eligible for the child tax credit payments will receive these payments on July the 15th and each month thereafter? Individuals who we have information for will receive the payments commencing July 15. It'll be based on a, July, on a 2020 return, if not a 2020, a 2019 return. We, uh, this week, we're in process and we'll complete the process by Ju June 16 of uh, sending out over 30 million, I think the number is actually 36 million letters to potentially eligible people. It's not saying they're eligible, but it's people that we may have information that might indicate they might be eligible. We have a very significant outreach program. We, uh, as I indicated earlier, we are launching um, one of our online tools this week. We're launching a second online tool in the very near future. We have invited members of this committee and members of Congress and staff members for a demonstration of our online tools. Uh, part of our inquiry and, and invitation is to get feedback from members of Congress and staff as to the tools. We're very proud, we think Congress will be very proud, but that doesn't mean that we have all the answers. We've been working with a lot of people. And we also realize that individuals, um, generically, individuals don't always go to irs.gov to get their information. So we're working with um, literally thousands and thousands of community-based organizations around the country to distribute information. Information will be distributed in multiple languages. Um, a lot of this is information that we learned in the first round of EIP, EIP-1, EIP-2, EIP-3, the outreach that we conducted. We've been very fortunate to interact with uh, more than 10,000 different organizations around the country that previously were not interactive with the Internal Revenue Service based on what our core processes were. So we have quite a bit of outreach that, you know, we, we will also be providing members of Congress and staff with um, toolkits and social media that you can use for your own, that you can use in your districts um, you know, both um, Twitter and, and mm -hmm. re relevant types of things. We need help getting the word out, as we did need help with respect to EIP 1, 2, and 3. We believe that the systems that are going to launch will be as seamless as possible. That's not saying, that's not, not saying that we'll be seamless. We, right. 
we have tested, we are testing, and um, you know, with each round of this type of situation, we learn and we get better, and well, we're look, pretty we, confident with what I, we have. I appreciate so. hearing all of that, and I will have my staff follow up and take advantage we of your that. offer. Uh, and we certainly want to be a partner in this regard. Uh, you know, uh, the reason I ask is last year an estimated 41 million uh, taxpayers did not receive a stimulus check because uh, they received an advance on their refund or they didn't file a tax return in advance of the July 15th, 2020 tax filing deadline. In addition, many taxpayers, especially those with young children, received checks that were incorrect and did not properly reflect the number of children in their household. Now, I met, heard you mention an online portal. Are you launching an online portal that allows working families to update their information with enough time to ensure that this money can get into their pockets by July 15th? The, when the portals launch, they will launch with the statutory requirements. And because, as you know, we moved the filing season back a month, the same people that work on filing season and EIPs in the IT context are the same people who work on this. So we got crunched, if you will, a little bit on time, but we will launch with the statutory requirements and then on a monthly basis thereafter, we will update the portals. Mm -hmm. And um, I should also indicate, you know, coming to the comment that everybody doesn't go to irs.gov, they will be able to walk into an IRS office. We will have paper interactions. People will be able to update on the phone. Once they're authenticated, we'll be able to update on the phone and ultimately, People will be able to use their personal online account at irs.gov to do these updates. And ultimately, we will also be in Spanish. Well, that's, that's good to hear. Uh, I know you mentioned on the phone. I just want to say that the National Taxpayer Advocate has continually ranked the IRS customer service as one of the most fear, serious problems facing the agency. With the 150 million calls that went to the IRS this year, only 7% of the calls reached an IRS employee. So I'm glad that we're going to have that service, but we have to have a service that actually works. Nothing more frustrating to a taxpayer, to a citizen, to say you can avail yourself of this service, and then when you avail yourself of it, you can't get someone to answer your question. If I may comment that the level of service, and particularly the phones, is an appropriated item. And as I have said this in the president's budget, the president asked for funding for 75 percent, for us to answer seven and a half out of 10 calls. That's an item that if we get that funding in the normal circumstances, we will be answering seven and a half out of 10 calls. The calls currently are about 19 minutes. Historically, they were 12 minutes. Our people are proudly interacting with Americans. We are principally the government agency other than SSA and VA to interact. And I have encouraged our people to spend a few more minutes. Our folks, these calls are emotional. A lot of people in this country have endured a lot of hardship, and we tend to be the people that they reach out to. So the calls, the longer calls and the increased volume have crunched that. But if, for example, instead of seven and a half, the Congress wanted us to go to eight and a half, that extra 10% of calls to be received, we would need an appropriation of another $100 million. And every IRS employee, myself included, want us to answer 10 out of 10 calls. It's thank not you. our choice. I, thank I, you very much. I, I, th I thank my colleague. Next is Senator Carper. And I think he's on the web. Senator Carper. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Um, many thanks to you and your staff. You're doing all right? Okay, we'll catch up. One of the ways we want to do Senator Senator Carper, your yeah. connection is not great. Let's try try again. I, there you go. There. Uh, how, is that better? Yes. All right, good. Um, Commissioner Reddick, I, I wanted to thank you and your staff for spending some time with my, my team and, and I, uh, with, as we try to uh, figure out how we're going to pay for uh, major investments in uh, service transportation or roads, highways, and bridges, and to do so in a way that, that, that the uh, Burden does not fall inordinately on low-income families. I thank you very much for trying to help us think outside of the box as we do that. So that's, that's just a thank you, and we look forward to continuing to work with, with you and your team on that, on that front. Uh, second, uh, I want to follow on with, with what uh, Senator Menendez uh, just uh, was, was, was questioning about in this customer service. We, uh, what is the old, uh, uh, the old cartoon uh, uh, guy, uh, Cartoon it was Pogo, I think it was Pogo, it was a long time ago. 
And he said, we have seen the enemy, it is us. And when it comes to, uh, to the Port Service, when, when the, the Congress and, and the three previous administrations just cut uh, the heck out of the, uh, the IRS year after year after year, and uh, provide, we, we take, continue to change the tax code, we make it more complex. Uh, we, we have for years not provided extra resources, not to ever provide the technology. Uh, no wonder the, uh, the uh, folks uh, that, that we're serving uh, aren't, uh, aren't satisfied with the service again. But we can do something about that. The president has proposed that. And my hope is the hope and prayers that my colleagues and I will do our, our job now going forward. But just, uh, I'm gonna, I thought this is a little bit repetitive. I'm gonna ask a question anyway. How would, how would the IRS budget uh, proposal before us help the agency close the tax gap, which we know is huge? And how would the tools in the Biden's plan complement your, uh, your efforts and your agency to uh, improve enforcement? The president's proposal has three critical components, um, each of which have an impact on the tax gap. The discretionary proposal um, provides for basically taking care of the attrition of the Internal Revenue Service. The PIA and the mandatory provisions have the ability to essentially build back the Internal Revenue Service, to rebuild our both service and enforcement side of the house. I think the committee is aware that we are down 17,000 enforcement personnel over the last decade, that the uh, tax complexities have increased significantly. The challenges and duties and responsibilities of the Internal Revenue Service have similarly increased significantly over the same time period. The complexities of um, structured transactions, if you will, by taxpayers on the outside, both corporate, individual, and pass-through entities, have increased significantly. The filing of partnership returns, I think the most current data is about 4.2 million partnership returns. And I think, as I've indicated earlier, I only have about 6,500 field revenue agents to deploy in every one of these neighborhoods, which is uh, compliant challenged. There are also provisions in the president's budget proposal for uh, additional information reporting, including information reporting in the virtual currency context. We are well aware that there are compliance challenges um, for folks engaged in virtual currencies. It's a high priority for the Internal Revenue Service and myself, together with others and we need to make resource decisions among those. The president's budget is designed to provide considerable assistance to both the taxpayer service side of the house, to modernization side of the house, to enforcement side of the house, as well as operations support. And it's those four key components that create tax administration um, for the Internal Revenue Service, for the people of this country, for Congress, and we know we can do it better, but we need appropriate, mandatory, multi-year, consistent funding to get there. It's also critical for us, if we're to get this legislation, that we receive direct hiring authority, which would allow us to quickly onboard the specialized level of individuals that we're looking for at the mid and toward the end of a normal career who are interested in coming on board. And so, there's an entire package, and sir, as we discussed the other day, I'm more than willing to meet with you and your staff and others to get into details of what we plan to do. I will say um, the IRS proudly employs the IRS, IRS leadership, have been working on our plan for many months. So if Congress enacts something, don't expect us to wait six months to show you what we intend to do. We're pretty close to there. And uh, I did a June 1 mandate a while ago for our leadership of what I wanted to see in terms of something to ultimately be able to share. And we were ahead of schedule. And I think you'll be proud. We need the funding. We get the legislation. We'll show you quickly what we intend to do. But we don't intend to wait six months to implement what we hope Congress provides to us. We'll be ready. Yeah, thanks so much. Lastly, how will this budget proposal in, uh, improve access to tax filing services for low? income and vulnerable taxpayers, Mr. Commissioner? Well, you know, it, the income equality issues, Treasury, and, and I know there's other senators that are very interested in this as well. Um, we've worked hard with Treasury in, on issues involving income and income equality, income inequality, and there are working groups at Treasury who are focused on this. Um, we are the tax administrators. Our, our role in that is essentially um, implementation and administratability of what Congress and the administration might do. 
And as far as um, you know, the, the voluntary income tax and free file and the rest, um, you know, you're hitting my sweet spot. The lower income taxpayers, the vulnerable taxpayers, the taxpayers who are challenged with the English language um, are the people that I think that we all owe a high degree of not only responsibility, but it's a privilege to help these folks get it right. They, by and large, are the ones who are trying to get it right. They get preyed upon by preparers. They're maybe a little confused. They're maybe not comfortable with the language. But personally, and I, I can say for most of the IRS employees, we consider it a privilege to be very active in these communities, and we will continue to be so. Oliver Wendell Holmes once said, taxes are what we pay for a civilized society. Thank you for, to you and your, uh, your team at the IRS for doing all you can to make sure that we uh, can collect the revenues that are needed so we're more civilized society. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Time the gentleman's expired. Senator Cardin. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And Commissioner Reddick, it's a pleasure to see you. We're, this hearing is about your budget. I've been one of the members that have been advocating for increased resources to the IRS for a long time. This budget is certainly a welcome budget to see the increase uh, in the president's budget for IRS. But I think it's important to point out that if you look at the historic decline of support for the Internal Revenue Service, uh, we are just making up for what we should have done in the past, and we still have a long way to go in regards to the resources necessary to efficiently collect the taxes of this country. And I was listening to your exchange with Senator Menendez in regards to the service issues, and I think we all recognize that you play a critical role and your, uh, your workers are on the front line uh, and uh, need to always be, have a smile with their service, recognizing the frustration of our constituents may be directed to them. So I just first want to thank the workers at the, at the IRS and to, to acknowledge that I hope this is a trend that we continue to give you the support you need to carry out your mission. I want to talk a little bit about the Taxpayer First Act, which deals with some of the issues we've already talked about. It's your customer service strategy, deals with cyber concerns, it deals with protecting taxpayers and low-income taxpayers. Uh, it was put on hold or sidelined as a result of COVID-19, the implementation of, of some of these issues. Can you just give us a realistic target date if this budget is approved by Congress as to the implementation of the Taxpayer First Act? In a, um, quite frankly, I think that the IRS might be living in a perfect storm if this budget is to pass. Um, we brought on a new director of the Taxpayer First Act office, Heather Malloy, she is instrumental in, in, you know, if we're looking at increasing staffing across all lanes, the Taxpayer First Act provisions are critical for that. Heather is now in daily meetings with myself um, in her role. We actually launched yesterday, we're referring to IRS Next. Um, the Taxpayer First Act provisions will be enacted extremely quickly, is the, the best I can give. I'm not trying to give you a lawyer answer. But I can tell you that all hands are on deck, that what we're seeing and how we're looking at things between funding, resources, staffing, uh, modernization, customer service, which is, I know it's important to you, it's very important to us. Um, all of these come together as a multifaceted approach to be able to provide uh, Americans what they deserve. And that's where we're headed. We are very focused on private sector interactions with customer base, if you will. We're trying to replicate or exceed where we can. We're trying to modernize our systems, and part of the president's proposal is a catch-up, if you will, for funding that we did not receive. You know, as, as you know, we've only received about 55% of the funding that was requested for our um, integrated business modernization plan. We've had to delay other projects in order to keep that project on, on target. That part of the president's proposal actually catches us up, allows us to move at a faster pace. So if you will, wrapped within the Taxpayer First Act, um, all lanes are coming together. We also, I'm, I'm sure you're aware, um, under the act, we did not get funding under the Taxpayer First Act. So we've been operating essentially without funding to do what we can do. But I will say that we have done quite a bit. And critically, uh, I think most of you are aware of, uh, we brought on a um, taxpayer experience officer, Ken Corbin. I'm, I'm confident that all of your staff are very familiar with Ken. 
Um, and importantly, um, Ken and I actually do um, randomly selected IRS employee Zoom calls. We send out 150 invitations. About half of those who respond get a, the first half that respond get a link. Multiple times a week, employees all around the country from Guam to Puerto Rico to you know, Washington, D.C., get on a Zoom call with Ken and I. So let me take you up on your offer of keeping us informed, as you said. If, if you could tell us how the implementation is occurring and where you're uh, – so we're together on expectations, what we can achieve. We know it's a challenge, and if you would keep us informed on that, and what else you need. Absolutely. I want to cover one other question, if I might, dealing with paid preparers. I've, uh, we've talked about this before, the lack of authority, and we have to do something about it. The chairman's been very active engaged in trying to give the authority to the IRS. But I see in the president's budget you're increasing the – fine against ghost preparers. Um, that's great, but can you enforce it? What type of enforcement are we going to have okay. in regards to those who are, are receiving uh, funds from taxpayers but are not re reporting that on the IRS uh, return? Yeah, the ghost preparers are individuals who prepare returns but don't sign them, and they do charge, and the line on the return is for a paid return preparer. And we do indicate when we, you know, I can't explain exactly how we get there. I know how we get there, but in a public forum, I should not indicate how we get there. But a word to the ghost preparer community is we know you're there. We are focused, and we have um, this option coming up in terms of civil penalties, and there could be criminal penalties because it, these returns tend to have similar errors, and they're batch returns with the same errors, so they get identified. So we, we will get there. We need all the tools we can in terms of uh, return preparers, and as you are well aware, um, they're preying on the most vulnerable taxpayers and the um, not only you know lower income folks, but folks who are not comfortable in the English language. And if you sit in one of these cases and you see what has happened to the individuals involved, you would be um, highly motivated to give us all the tools we can on the preparer world. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, I think this is an area that I know you're interested in. I think we should really follow up on. I, I very much appreciate your leadership on this, Senator Cardin. Senator Brown's next. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thanks very much for doing this hearing. And welcome back, Commissioner. You thank spent you. A lot of time. you spent a lot of time in this committee, so thank you. And it start by uh, joining my colleagues and thanking the men and women of the IRS. You've been uh, withstanding drastic budget cuts, the pandemic, and frankly, a Congress that's um, not done its job in providing the resources you need is you know, Senator King and I have led efforts to provide you with more funding. I'm very happy the president's put forward a proposal to do this. Um, and I echo the words of senators, I, the ones I've listened to in the last few minutes, Senator Carper and Cardin, I know others, and Senator Menendez also uh, talked about this. I, one of the most important parts of the American Rescue Plan was the expansion of the child tax credit. As you know, I've asked you about this before. Uh, Secretary Yellen is going to begin in February in July, giving the what what she's doing with the child tax credit, the monthly payments. Uh, we the rescue plans also expanded the earned income tax credit for workers not raising children in the home. We know that that twenty percent of people eligible for EITC don't claim it. One out of five. Uh, many families, because of the rescue plan, will be eligible for the first time. So I want to follow up on Senator Menendez's questions. Um, Commissioner, how, how will the IRS use increased funding to better reach and better serve filers eligible for EITC and now in the CTC and to increase take up of the EITC? What are your plans? I, I will indicate that present indications are that we will um, spend more than the funding that we have been appropriated with respect to the CTC, given the extent of outreach uh, efforts that we are undertaking and plan to undertake. This includes um, meetings around the country. We have already had a CTC summit with uh, more than 25 uh, representatives of community groups. We have um, interactions with a lot of people around the country. We sent out 30 million letters this week. Um, they'll be completed by the 16th. We have three rounds of outreach letters going out to individuals about an awareness. We're launching our online tools uh, soon, which include four different tools, the IRS Gov uh, landing page, a non-filer tool, a CTC update tool, frequently asked questions that will be posted, and an eligibility tool. Eligibility tool will be similar to the 
eligibility, the EITC assistant tool that many of you are familiar with, and, um, and so in terms of the outreach, we're coordinating with the same community groups and trying to expand that that we did with respect to EIP 1, 2, and 3. And we are on the ground throughout the country. We also, as I uh, may have indicated earlier, we um, will be providing toolkits to every member of Congress, as we did with respect to EIPs. We will be providing toolkits to um, different state agencies, as well as state taxing authorities around the country, and agencies principally that um, are providing other types of benefits to individuals. We um, have a lot of media outlets, and the scope, if you will, of outreach for the IRS has greatly expanded, really as a result of EIP 1, 2, and 3. The, the STEMIs have been fantastic for us in terms of getting into the communities. Uh, thank you, Commissioner. Um, there, there are a number of people on this committee that care about this. I just saw on my screen one of the real leaders in this, Senator Bennett, and uh, he and I and others will continue to talk to you, particularly as the July date approaches. Let me shift in my last couple of minutes, Mr. Chair, um, to compliance. My constituents in Ohio know if they punch a clock or swipe a badge, uh, they have to pay the taxes they legally owe. When people cheat the system, it means workers doing an honest day's work in small businesses playing by the rules or exploited by the rich guys outgunning the IRS. Uh, part of the problem is that their income for IRS, obviously, is their income is more complex. We don't have adequate reporting and the money's harder to follow, making it easier for them to get away with not paying what they owe. You, you obviously know that. Um, tell us if you would, the, I mean, the president's proposal benefits honest taxpayers that currently have to compete with the dishonest cheats. Tell me, tell us how much revenue would this bring <laughs> in, uh, without raising taxes by a penny that we could use to pay for investments and in infrastructure and other things if we were able to, to get 100% compliance, what would it mean? Well, um, you know, I really leave the, the computations to the Office of Tax Analysis at Treasury and others, and I think like you, we've seen um, funds figures range from $1.4 trillion, $700 billion to hundreds of billions of dollars. Uh, what I can indicate based on my private practice experience and my tenure here at the Internal Revenue Service <laughs> is that um, giving us the appropriate resources will be an absolute game changer for this country, both in terms of services to taxpayers uh, and enforcement. And enforcement supports compliant taxpayers. The more that people understand that the IRS is doing its job, and to do our job, we need resources. We need consistent multi-year funding. We need mandatory funding. We need direct hiring authority. We will do our job. We will hire the people we need to hire, but we absolutely have to have the resources to do so. We will work with Congress. I'm more than willing to come up, meet collectively, individually, and walk through it. And I think pre previously at this hearing, I indicated that you know my anticipation was we should be able to collect whatever the actual tax gap is. We should be able to collect somewhere between 10 and 20 percent with an understanding that the people we bring on board, there will be a curve. We will not be as effective initially in, in when we onboard everybody, but this agency and the desire of our employees is very good at what it does, and we respect the rights of taxpayers. Um, I'm... I'm insensitive to folks who say that we are going to treat taxpayers on the streets unfairly. We are not. And our employees live in the communities that we examine, that we interact with, and we're very proud to do so. So this is not an agency, and I'm familiar with the history, Senator Roth's hearings in 98 and what led to those hearings. This is not that agency. Our employees, and I think they have showed it with respect to EIP 1, 2, and 3 and getting back into the office, our employees are proud to do what they're doing. Give us the resources, and we will make you proud as well. Thank, thank, thank you very, very, very much. Important issues, Senator Brown. Senator Cantwell. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And following up on that resource uh, question, thank you for being here today, um, Commissioner. I uh, know that the IRS has lost a lot of employees since 2010. Um, tens of thousands of employees since then. And so while there's a lot of discussion today about making sure that corporations and high income filers, uh, you've made statement that some of the budget requests by the administration, I think 4,500 new employees you're proposing would work on those uh, high income filers and those investigations. But you know, we've just had round tables with some of our small business owners and 
I heard a, a longstanding concern, which is just that we need more people at the IRS to be answering phone calls about basic things for small businesses. So what, what of that new hiring do you think would go to those kinds of activities? The president's budget request, the highest in the discretionary, the highest allocation is, and I'm searching for the number, which I have here somewhere, but is 13% for taxpayer services, which is exactly the folks that you are referring to. And it's about 9% for enforcement, and then it's about 36% for modernization, which also provides taxpayer services, the ability to interact with us in a seamless and comfortable manner. So um, that's all in the discretionary budget for the administration. The PIA is enforcement-oriented because we're down 17,000 enforcement personnel. And um, when I use the term enforcement, that is not just frontline revenue agent, revenue officers, but that would include appeals officers, it would include taxpayer advocate representatives, it would include IRS counsel people. It's sort of a package. We cannot just increase one piece of the IRS when IRS is tax administration, which is a process. And at a, at a House hearing recently, I made a comment. Um, everybody's focused on the IRS and budget and staffing and resources. Keep in mind that in the district courts, the claims courts, the bankruptcy courts, and in criminal prosecutions, the Department of Justice handles the matters for us. They represent the interests of the Internal Revenue Service. And if we get a significant increase in staffing and the Department of Justice, specifically the tax division, does not, you should anticipate a bottleneck on us giving cases that they are unable to handle because of their staffing issues. They are a significant part of both civil and criminal um, tax administration in this country. But we are focused on all lanes of the IRS and significantly in the service arena. So it would be great. I, I, excuse me, I, I come from a small business family and was a small business owner on the outside. And, um, you know, we don't intend to leave anybody behind. Great. Well, I'm definitely hearing from people that they're feeling left behind, at least from a communications yep. perspective. So I'm appreciating that that largest amount, you're saying 13%. Would, would go to that. So if someone could follow up with me just on what you think that would mean as it relates to services or uh, improvement in services, that would be so helpful. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank my colleague, Senator Portman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Commissioner, welcome back. Thank you. Uh, we had a good conversation with you uh, only about a month and a half ago and had the opportunity to talk about a number of these issues. But in terms of compliance, you and I had a discussion about the need for better taxpayer service. Senator Cardin and I um, wrote this bill called the Protecting Taxpayers Act, some of which is now being implemented, and I appreciate that. It, it's uh, part of the Taxpayer First Act. But this modernization effort is never-ending, and the challenges are more and more sophisticated. Now I'm going to talk about cryptocurrency for a second. Um, we talked about digital assets and cryptocurrency back in April when you were before us, and you talked about the low visibility of these taxpayers and the importance of their compliance in closing the tax gap. I talked about how we were working on potential legislation to, to address that. Uh, I want to ask you a couple of questions about it. I noticed in the budget that you have uh, 41 million bucks to expand cyber crimes efforts and $32 million for crypto-related enforcement operations. You've also proposed additional information reporting for businesses that receive crypto assets with a fair market value of more than $10,000. Um, in addressing the issues related to information reporting on cryptocurrency, do you feel that the IRS has the necessary authority to issue appropriate regulations? I think we need congressional authority. We, we get challenged. Um, as you're aware, we get challenged frequently, and to have a clear dictate from Congress on the authority of us to collect that information is critical. And the most recent market cap in that world, in the crypto world, exceeded $2 trillion and more than 8,600 exchanges worldwide. And by design, most crypto uh, virtual currencies are designed to stay off the radar screen. So you know, we will be challenged. Right now, what we do is we issue John Doe summonses, and I think it was highly public. We recently did that. We're very active in both the civil and the criminal enforcement world. Uh, we do need additional tools, and we absolutely need additional resources. Okay. Well, I, I appreciate that answer, and as you know, we want to work with you. We've circulated some, some 
ideas, uh, and including uh, to some of the stakeholders, and we, we want to be sure that we get your input on that as it relates to cryptocurrencies and digital assets. We would appreciate the opportunity to work with you. Thank you. On the issue of staffing, uh, I support more resources to the IRS. I have uh, for years uh, since I was involved in the reform efforts a couple of decades ago. Uh, and it's for my small business uh, constituents back in Ohio and individuals who are having to struggle with this overcomplicated tax code. You want smart, effective people at the IRS to work with. And, uh, and the professionalism is important. The training is important. One of my concerns is you're asking for a lot of new people, and it takes a while to train them up. And um, I see that you have asked for hiring of at least 5,000 new personnel for enforcement alone, uh, but you say it should not exceed a manageable 15% per year. Uh, over 10 years, it seems that probably would double the IRS workforce. So do you have the ability to train these people up and to make them effective? And second, do you have the workforce um, out there to tap into? In other words, are you having trouble hiring people? We, um, we're actually looking at hiring, and we, you know, I may have indicated earlier, we, uh, we started developing a plan months ago. We went a little bit at risk, if you will. And so if we receive legislation, we'll be able to implement quickly upon that uh, receipt of legislation. But our view and my view is we're looking at different categories of individuals. We're not looking necessarily, as one might think, for individuals with less than five or 10 years of experience uh, on the outside. We're looking for that category, certainly, but we're also looking for the mid-career people, maybe aged you know, 35 to 45, we're also looking for people at my age category, and, and those last two categories can come in, hit the ground running, both in terms of managing a team of, if you will, examiners if they're on the enforcement side, as well as being instructors, and we need private sector people to come in and help us in terms of instructing, particularly in the partnership and virtual currency worlds, come in and serve as instructors to the mid and lower, uh, lesser experienced, if you will, folks. So we have, we have a variety of plans. We also are working on our outreach to different communities, not just the professional communities, but colleges, institutions, and others. We also are working on facilities where we would place facilities for an increase in personnel. And I think uh, the committee may be aware that proudly we recently opened a facility in um, Puerto Rico. And um, for the first time in a long time, we received more applicants, more qualified applicants, then we posted for positions, and you know, benefit is the folks there were also, many of them are also multilingual. We're also looking at opening facilities in um, certain underserved communities, and we're already on the ground in those communities looking to see what we can do in terms of opening facilities should we receive legislation. And I give you that as an indication that um, we are not waiting for legislation. We will be ready. But you'll need the appropriation of additional funding to be able to follow through on this. Absolutely. Plan. Without without the yeah. funding. We've, well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think, you know, the oversight responsibilities of this committee are such that it'd be good to continue to have this discussion and be sure that, uh, you know, we're, we're on board with regard to the, the plans. We, we've got Senator Thune funding. waiting, and I, I certainly share your thoughts there. Senator Thune. Senator Thune, the, the report was that you were awaiting. There, I got you. Sorry, sorry, Chairman. I did. I had to push. No, push my no. Go right ahead. Yeah. Thanks, uh, Commissioner. Uh, good morning, and welcome back, to the Committee. And thanks again for your service. Um, according to the IRS, overall tax compliance rates have been holding steady around 85 percent since the 1980s. Voluntary tax compliance has been around 82 to 84 percent and net tax compliance around 85 to 86 percent after late payments and enforcement. Uh, would you say that the U.S. has a relatively high and stable tax compliance rate? I believe that's accurate. I believe that's accurate. That's based. And that's based. How, 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 does the, uh, how does the U.S. voluntary tax compliance rate compare with other countries, particularly uh, OECD countries, would you say? Yeah, I don't have the data. I don't have the da I'm getting an echo. I'm not sure everybody else is. It went away. I don't have the data on the OECD, OECD countries, but I do believe that, particularly among sophisticated countries, that the compliance rate in the, in the low 80s is uh, meaningful. And uh, keeping in mind that the compliance rate is based on the data that we are aware of based on identified noncompliance. Okay. 
So given the number, different numbers being thrown around about the size of the tax gap, um, and I'm left to wonder, like a lot of people are, how we will be able to measure whether we are narrowing the tax gap if we can't even agree on the size of it. The latest official IRS estimates uh, showed a reduced tax gap compared to prior years in this century, uh, which is a good thing, but the tax gap clearly remains a problem. Uh, let me ask you, what is the agency doing to improve how it estimates uh, the tax gap so we can get a number that's more timely and more accurate? Well, when I got on board um, was pr prior, was the last tax gap issued when I got on board was for years prior to 2011. In 2019, issued tax gap information for 2011 to 13, which personally I think that I found kind of unacceptable in terms of developing an audit plan going forward. One, it's already at this time seven years old. Two, it looked to an economy that was not a digital world economy. Three, it looked to an economy that did not have a virtual currency and many other types of monetary type of transactions that were out there. It also did not address um, inbound transactions, if you will, foreign-based um, taxpayers doing business in the United States are completely absent from our computations. So gave the challenge to our RAS unit, which is our research unit, and in the recent testimony, the um, acting director of RAS testified uh, that he believed that the 2019 tax gap figure was about $646 billion before you get to the rest of these items. What we are comfortable saying is the tax gap is significant. Significant resources will help us um, put a significant impact, if you will, and I apologize for using that term three times, but uh, on the tax gap. And we have said that we believe that we can, with appropriate resources, modernization, and the impl implementation of that, staffing, um, uh, training, and all that, that we should be able to recover about between 10 and 20% of the tax gap on an annual basis. I think that the desire of every employee at the IRS would be to, to recover more of that, more than 10 or 20 percent. And I think it's fair for Congress to hold us to, if you give us all these resources, to provide you with metrics of what we're doing, how we're doing it, and the impact of that, both in terms of taxpayer service as well as in terms of, um, you know, the enforcement side of the house. And, you know, what ultimately what should be the question on measurement is the deterrent factor rather than what we're able to actually capture. But um, our, we're gonna issue a tax gap report for 2012, 13, and 14 in 2022. We're also gonna issue some forecasting into the current because this data is important for us to determine what we're doing currently. So having seven-year-old data, personally, I thought was somewhat unacceptable to develop you know, work plans today. And uh, for about two years now, um, you know, I'm, I'm on board less than three years, but for about two years now, our RAS group has been working very hard and they've made a lot of success and we hope to be able to share that with you. So during 2022, we will issue the, the next group, if you will, but we need to get this data more current. Uh, you know, you want to know it, we need to know it. So we are focused, we have been focused on that. And, um, you know, the tax gap is both service and enforcement have an impact. And as you said, the voluntarily compliant taxpayers need help. If we just increase those rates that you mentioned, 1%, you consider IRS brings in about $3.5 trillion each year, a 1% increase in voluntary compliance by itself is $35 billion per year. I thank, thank, my, thank my colleague. Can I quick, quickly point out before my, my time expired, but I would just, it, it, to, the, to the commissioner say, that I think one of the reasons too, people can't get through. And I think high quality customer service will help with voluntary tax compliance. And uh, we get lots of calls of people who wait on, uh, you know, for hours on the phone. And the, uh, according to the National Taxpayer Advocate, only about two out of every hundred phone calls are getting through. So I think that would be a, a huge improvement uh, too, as well, in terms of- I, I, I thank my colleague, Senator Langford is next. Mr. Chairman, thank you. Sir. Good to see you again. Uh, thanks for being here and, and uh, going through so many different questions. Can I ask a question on just operations? Uh, when we will get operations fully up post-COVID for face-to-face -face meetings, for interactions, what's your time frame at this point? Um, we are open. 
our, our submission processing centers are open. They are actually working multiple shifts. They're working weekends. This is our, our filing group. Um, our mail is all being, we get about one, and a, one to one and a half pieces of mail per week. We got 1.2 million pieces of mail last week. The mail is being opened in less than a week and put into processing. So that's, you know, people on the ground um, doing it. And it's the, the quality of the employees that we have is spectacular. Our interactions, we flip to a virtual environment like the rest of the world. Um, we will stay in a teleworking virtual environment somewhat indefinitely. I, I do have a concern and, you know, and onboarding people, a lot of people out in the private sector want to have a virtual environment. We need to train, you can't train, my example, 704B regs remotely when people are multitasking. We need to have people understand what we're training them. And similarly, the collegiality and learning what it is that we do and what we don't do. Um, we need to have people in my, my, I'm a little old school and I understand that, but in my mind, people need to be around people to pick up some of that. So we got to hit the right blend. We are working with NTEU significantly on what's the right model for our agency. And we have different categories of individuals. You know, we, we, we have people who open mail through the most sophisticated cybersecurity folks on the planet. And we intend to get this right. But I will say a silver lining um, in March of 2020, our customer service representatives, the folks who answer the phone, only 3% were telework eligible. 100% are currently telework eligible. And where that came as a benefit is when we had the snowstorms and the cold fronts and had to shut down some of our facilities, those folks could go to work at, at home. So we've had some benefits. I'm going to have some follow-up with you on that, on sure. dealing with remote work long-term and the possibility that uh, you could expand uh, your pool of individuals to be able to hire from anywhere yep. across the world. Uh, quite frankly, if they're working for... Uh, some of our U.S. military and their spouses and other folks, I'd love to be able to work with you and to be able to make. We are engaged with military spouses, right. and they tend to be an excellent. Um, I'm going to. I'm going to. I'm going to so continue to be able to talk love the about opportunities the ahead. So let, let, let's do that. I want to ask about this bank reporting repo, uh, proposal that's come out in the president's budget. Is uh, his proposal is requiring financial financial institutions, banks, to report any transaction of, of six hundred dollars or more. Uh, to be able to come in. Obviously, that captures a tremendous number of transactions from banks. Uh, I think a lot of American people don't already don't know $10,000 or more are already reported in. Uh, this would take that to $600 or more. So my questions are, do you need that level, that granular level of information from banks to the IRS to be able to validate reporting? Well, similar with what happened with when FATCA came in and we got FATCA reporting, we did not get the funding to modernize our systems to handle the reporting that we were receiving. So we remain behind the curve on our ability to use that information. To the extent we get additional reporting information here, we absolutely must have funding. And these are somewhat separate lanes, but it's all interconnected. Funding to actually process information. And critically, it's not just, everybody's focused on our ability to process information for enforcement and examination leads. It's similarly important for us to uh, be able to process information so we know the taxpayers not to examine, to lessen the burden that we would otherwise place on taxpayers based upon uh, uh, information there. So we need modernization, we need analysts, and we need you know service representatives on that. If, so if what, what would you there. need budget-wise to just fulfill that? And is that $600 transaction amount something that IRS requested to be included in? Where did that number come from? Uh, those proposals, you know, are from the administration and from Treasury. Okay. Uh, so what level of funding would you need to be able to process that level of information? Because that's a lot of information the administration's asking for. Yeah, I'd have to get you the specifics on that breakout. I don't have the specifics. but we I would can, assume it's exponentially we, large, larger than a $10,000 because a $10,000 transaction is turning right now. Dropping it to six hundred dollars is going to catch. I, I can't even imagine how many more. You're telling me now you don't have the resources to be able to fulfill the $10,000 reports that are coming in. Is that correct? We need resources across all lanes to be effective, giving us one lane. And then, you know, quite frankly, it, it's been troublesome being on board when we see our inspector general say, Iris is not doing this, this, and this, but we don't have the funding to do that. So we sort of get caught in that. So we need, all lanes need to be funded. These provisions are interconnected. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Time of the gentleman's expired. Senator Casey is next. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank the commissioner 
for his appearance and for his public service. I want to thank you as well, Commissioner, for the remarkable and, and can, what can only be described as an enormous effort you've had to undertake and your team has undertaken in the course of the pandemic. And I have and will continue to advocate for the IRS to have the resources which are so critical to fulfill its responsibility. In this committee's April hearing, you projected that the tax gap could be as high as $1 trillion, meaning $1 trillion in taxes going unpaid every year. We know that many of the, these uh, non-filers are high-income individuals. I've heard from many Pennsylvanians since then, since um, April, who were uh, concerned, if not outraged, about this gap and would like to see all taxpayers play by the same rules. The President's 2022 budget request has funding requested to scale up both staffing and operations at the IRS to expand both enforcement and compliance. Can you explain how additional, uh, that additional funding would assist the IRS in going after uh, tax cheats and ensuring that all taxpayers are paying their fair share? If, if Cong you know, I have 17 months left on my term. If Congress gives us the funds, we will implement. We are ahead of the curve to implement legislation that is not yet passed. That should be, you know, we're willing to come up and, exp and show what we have and where we do it, but that should give an indication of the desire. It's not just me, but me and everybody else. We want to be impactful on services. We want people to receive the services they deserve from the Internal Revenue Service. And we are well aware. I came in with the same thing, I think, in my, probably in my confirmation hearing, but certainly through today, have always said the same thing. And I said it for 36 years on the outside, that enforcement supports compliant taxpayers, that the bulk of the revenue this country receives comes from compliant taxpayers. Uh, you're, you're well aware that, you know, my, I'm very proud, but my, I think I'm the first commissioner whose spouse came to this country as a refugee. My in-laws are not comfortable in the English language. I have a line of sight into vulnerable communities. Um, I come from, you know, a mother who was raised in a storeroom to a uh, diner, and I, you know, learned as a child how you take a shower with a, a sink in a diner. We have lines of sight there. We can improve the conditions for every American, and the people who make an effort to comply need to know that we're there to help them. I think significantly during 2020, I could have come to you and said, we have a plan for languages, but in, in, in uh, September of last year, we launched a language program during the pandemic when we were on our heels in so many different directions, and the 2020-1040 is in English and Spanish. You can call into our centers and get translation uh, services in more than 350 languages, and there's a schedule LEP on the 2020-1040 that individuals can check a box and ask the Internal Revenue Service to communicate in a different language. As of March, more than 220,000 individuals checked that box. Those types of services, to me, are equally important as the enforcement side. I only have 6,500 field revenue agents. We need more. And, you know, um, I'm running out of runway, as they say, on the outside in terms of my, my term. This agency will, will do the right thing well beyond me, but I, like you, want to help them get there. People came on board when I did with considerable private practice experience in the lanes that we are going to receive funding to be impactful in, and we are doing our best. So I think you'll be proud but without funding... If you just look at one category, 6,500 field revenue agents, 4.2 million partnership returns. That's before we get to the high wealth individuals, to the corporate, to the, to the this, to the that. You know, we, we, Commissioner, thanks. We, we look forward to working with you on those <clears throat> resources because um, I think the Congress, both parties, both houses are duty bound to get you the resources um, if we say, if we believe what we say. Um, last, and I know I'm, I'm out of time, maybe I'll submit this for the record, uh, might be easier for the committee purposes, but I want to talk to you, send you a question about uh, tax scams, um, but I'm running out of time, so I'll make sure that we, we send you that question for the record. But and I am you. available to meet with the members one-on-one -on -one or just to meet with your staff. Um, 
you know, place the call. We're here. That's what we do. Commissioner, thank you very much. Thank and, you. And thank chair. you for your efforts, particularly as chair of the aging committee going after those tax scams, um, Senator Casey. Um, next, we have Senator Bennett, who I think is online. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Can you hear me? Can you hear me, Mr. Chairman? We can hear you, Senator Bennett. Okay. Thank you very much, and thank you, Commissioner, for your testimony today. I and I, I know it, as others have asked um, uh, about uh, the child tax credit, well, which, as okay. you know, the American Rescue Plan uh, significantly expanded. The expansion is based on on my bill with Senator Brown, the American Family Act, which will give 96% of American families advance payments to $250 per month per child, or $300 per month per child under the age of six. This expansion uh, will cut childhood poverty nearly in half this year, with even larger effects uh, for kids of color. I am deeply grateful, I wanna first say, uh, Commissioner, for all you and the IRS staff have done to ensure that Americans will receive the monthly CTC payments starting on July 15th. And I'm really pleased by Treasury's announcement that 88% of children will receive these benefits without further action needed from their families. And I think <laughs> it's fair to say, Commissioner, that you were a big part of making sure that that could happen because of the work that you've done before. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about how the resources in your fiscal year 2022 budget request help IRS ensure payments get to the hardest to reach populations. And uh, and I also say that I'm thrilled that the Biden administration is committed to extending the expanded monthly CTC through at least 2025. I plan to do everything I can do in my power, along with Senator Brown and many of our colleagues, to make it permanent in the long term, if extended or made permanent. What additional resources, both ongoing and one time, should Congress consider giving the IRS to ensure monthly CTC payments are made as smoothly and system systematically as possible and reach all eligible children? The, the amount of money, if Congress was to pass legislation, we would be able to provide um, information as the amount of funding required to um, operate this on a permanent basis. But we would need to see the legislation to see what the requirements are for us to be able to do so, and, and we would be able to do so. We would really appreciate, and we do appreciate the fact that um, to the extent Congress works with us in legislation, it's very important, I can say, from what I've seen in my almost three years, that uh, we get involved in terms of helping with respect to the administrability of provisions so that we can provide seamless assistance to the folks. Uh, I will say with respect to CTC, we are, we, you should expect and you should hope and you should require that we do historic outreach, and we are doing historic outreach. We're capitalizing on the outreach um, that we did with respect to the three rounds of uh, EIP, EIP one, two, and three, you know, I guess affectionately referred to now on the street as the STEMIs. But we learned a lot. We, ha we created a lot of partnerships, if you will, with community organizations. Those have served us well. We've uh, this week sent out 30 million letters that uh, will be completed for potentially eligible people. We have four rounds of letters going out. Um, if we need to do more letters, we will do more letters. I made a comment earlier that um, our present estimate is that we will be spending more money than we were funded with respect to the six months because of outreach. This is not an agency that pulls up when there's you know, no more money left to spend. We actually delay other activities so that we can do what you would want us to do, and outreach is a significant component here. So. Um, I think you'll be proud. I think you'll be proud of the online tools and invite you to you and your staff to a demonstration of those tools. Well, Commissioner, again, part of one of the partners you got during the previous work you're talking about was my office. I'm very grateful with the spirit with which you're approaching this work. So anything we can do to help, we stand ready to, to help. Um, turning to a different subject in the last minute that I have, Commissioner, I and I, I know a number of my colleagues on this committee are deeply, deeply concerned that some of our nation's largest, most successful companies like Amazon and their exceedingly well-off um, owners pay little or no federal tax. And while many small businesses have lost income and families uh, have lost jobs during the pandemic, many of these large companies have seen profits and wealth soar to unprecedented heights. In your view, how much of this problem is caused by loopholes or tax expenditures written into our 
nation's tax laws and how much of it is due to actual evasion such as companies shifting income uh, overseas and how will the fiscal year 2022 budget request help IRS address tax evasion by large companies? I, I think it's a combination. You know, I was on the outside um, between, you know, well, until I came on board here. But when I, what we saw in terms of <clears throat> transactions and structuring happened when the IRS essentially was on its back from the Roth hearings from 98 through about 2002, 2003. I don't think it's a coincidence that structuring got much more aggressive in the planning communities. I'm not saying that it was appropriate or inappropriate, but people tend to take advantage if they see the IRS as being vulnerable. Um, we are not vulnerable when we're on the scene. We are not vulnerable as to the taxpayers that we are able to contact. And in the um, transfer pricing, I think is one of the comments that you made, in the transfer pricing arena, we have cases that are you know, exceeding five and $10 billion. And if you're the taxpayer in one of those cases, you are gonna spend a billion dollars to save you know, four or $9 billion. And keep in mind, IRS has a budget of you know, maybe $12 billion total to run the entire operation. We need funding to be impactful. We need specialized agents, we need training, we need people from the outside, we need people from the inside, and none of what I've said about hiring people from the outside should be disparaging to the people on the inside. We need a blend of expertise, and uh, we need to be able to be on watch. This country deserves to have the best tax administration agency on the planet. It should appropriately fund the agency. We need direct hiring authority. We need consistent multi-year timely funding, mandatory funding, and I believe, and with your oversight and interactions, I believe you'll be proud in what we do to get to the terms that people use. Everyone pays their fair share. Um, there's a difference between evasion, as you've identified, between evasion and you know, aggressive transactions. But the aggressive transactions, in my estimation, I was not on a planning side of transactions on that side. I was a controversy lawyer. But they get more aggressive if they think that we're vulnerable. And, um, you know, I got to tell you, we're, we're not vulnerable as to the people we are able to touch, but the taxpayers that we're not able to touch, we're not able to touch. Help us. Help us get this Thank right. You. The desire is here. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank my colleague. I, I believe Senator Warner is going to go next, and he's on the web. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And, um, Appreciate you had holding this hearing. Commissioner Reddick, first of all, I'm, um, I'm sure other members have said this, express my um, thanks to you and all of your um, staff. I hope you will convey. I know it's been a challenging last 15 months. And while we, I've said, and my staff have, have shared some of the frustrations with closed offices and all, um, I, I do think the agency writ large has performed well. Could you, you know, you just in your last impassioned statement to Senator Bennett, I'd like to pick up on a couple of um, uh, of those threads. Uh, can you talk a little bit about how much more effective and predictable it would be? Uh, and what are the if specific benefits that would come from a stable multi year funding stream for the agency? How much money is wasted or how many activities are are put on hold because of the um, some of our bad behavior in Congress in terms of uh, continuing resolutions and threats of budget shutdowns? You know, the, the, no. the um, lack of consistent funding causes the agency, the way the agency adjusts its budget is it has attrition. And as attrition, as when we don't get funding, we don't replace the people who, uh, who retire. We have been stellar in the last three years in our ability to hire and move people around in, internally. And it has made a huge difference. When I got on board, one of the comments that I heard was, we'll be able to replace, you know, let's plan on replacing maybe 25% of attrition. That's of an agency that already has, you know, if you will, 17,000 fewer enforcement agents. Um, how can that be? How can you plan on having tax administration in the greatest country on the planet and only replace 25% of the most experienced people you have and you need those people to train the new people. We had a funding, a hiring gap from 2011 to 2018, which means that, you know, I use that in terms of uh, recruitment. I tell people there is nobody above you. 
to the extent you come on board, you train, and you learn, you can be all you want to be inside our agency. And, uh, and that is true. And we are very hopeful to get the funding to be able to be impactful, to provide both services. And, you know, the, the press seems to just pick up on the enforcement side of, of the president's budget. But the highest category in the discretionary budget is for services and for modernization, 13%. Increase for services, 36% for modernization. Those two go to helping underserved communities. They go to helping us answer the phones, to getting chatbots, to having it be a, an experience like people would have in dealing with the private sector. We want to be there. The desire is there. The staffing issues that we have are significant. We have 52,000 people to replace in the next six years. That's the wow. net figure. That's our experience on the people. Sir, let me just let me just let me just uh, ask on that uh, that Sorry. number replacement. Um, are there additional? You've talked about the need to get specialized personnel. Are there additional authorities that you need beyond the money for you to be able to go out and hire the right people? Absolutely, we must have direct hiring authority. I cannot go into the private sector and try to recruit mid-level, even new, but mid-level or senior level people to come on board who will be immediately impactful. People who have my experience, maybe not my age, but maybe my age, who can come in and be impactful and run teams of examiners or teams of lawyers or teams of appeals officers in the entire um, you know, compliance side of the house immediately. They have the experience on the outside, but without direct hiring authority, I cannot keep these people interested in coming on board for a three, six or nine month period. They will go elsewhere or decide they're just going to either retire or do what they're doing. We need to capitalize on the interest that we are able to generate. There are people like myself who want to come on board for the good of the country, if you will, but we need to bring them on board when we have that interest. You know, interest wanes with time. And, you know, the, the mid and senior career people are not coming on board for the economics of this. They're, like myself, I didn't come on board with the idea to go get my dream job after being commissioner, I left my dream job with my best friends. And, you know, I've frequently said it's public. My next job is not going to involve suits. It, it is going to involve carburetors. Let me get in one last quick question, which is, and this may have been asked if it has, I apologize. You, I think you made a good point earlier. We've got, we focus on tax evasion, but the other half of that is just plain, you know, aggressive, yep. uh, pushing the edge, trying to be legal, pushing the edge. When we think about that tax gap, whether it's seven hundred billion or a trillion or whatever number, can you just could you give us some guesstimate on how much of that is evasion and how much of that is overly aggressive behavior? If I look to experience on the outside, you know, well, in terms of numbers, the higher income people are surrounded by highly experienced lawyers, accountants, economists, you know, um, pass through specialists, and the rest. And all of those folks aren't typically going to be involved in an evasion, potential criminal case, um, although we do call them on it, and we, have, we are active, and we're active in terms of a lot of different arenas that I, I probably shouldn't go into publicly. So I would say that the majority is folks who tend to get aggressive in the structuring of transactions, maybe with an eye that the IRS won't be there. It's completely inappropriate to play what's known as the audit lottery. Will the IRS audit this taxpayer? If so, do we step in and say, oh, we made a mistake? Multiple mistakes, multiple years is a pattern, and that creates a criminal case, and I think people are familiar with that. Um, you know, keep in mind, the largest criminal tax case in the history of the United States involved professionals, not taxpayers. It was out of the Southern District of New York, and it was at a time when the IRS was perceived to be vulnerable between 1998 and 2000, and it was in 2002. So although I come from the practitioner community, and I hold practitioners in high regard. It's a very difficult occupation. It never ends. Um, they are also part of tax administration and need to do the right thing. I was at a program early on in my career as commissioner in front of more than a thousand of colleagues and made one comment, and I would repeat that comment to y'all today and to the extent any of them are watching, and I know that a lot of our employees are watching, and my comment was when I came on board as commissioner, I respected pretty much every tax practitioner that I ever interacted with in practice, I get it. It's tough, whether you're a preparer or you're in a different function. 
And my comment to my colleagues at that time and my comment today is when I leave as commissioner and I'm in my last 17 months, they ought to all hope I have that same respect for them. I expect my colleagues to step up and do the right thing, not take advantage of an IRS that some may perceive to be um, challenged resource or otherwise. And if Congress helps us, and we do need help, if Congress helps us, we will respond appropriately and I think make everybody proud. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Warner. Next is Senator Cortez Mastel. Thank you. Commissioner, thank you. I, I echo um, comments of my colleagues with the, the challenges that um, the IRS has faced, uh, particularly being underfunded. And I know even in Nevada, I've had Nevadans reach out to me um, in frustration because they were unable to reach anyone at the IRS. Um, and I think this hearing today is helpful to hopefully have people understand the challenges uh, that you're facing right now, particularly being underfunded. So my first question to you is you, you mentioned to Senator Warner that there's 52,000 positions that you have to replace. Is that correct? 52,000 is our attrition over the next six years. So if we do nothing, if we hired zero, we would go from about an 83,000 employee operation and you would take 52,000 out of that. That's the net number. And thankfully, IRS employees have a history of staying on board about five years beyond their, um, their uh, eligibility for retirement. And so I just wanted so that's to correct. So those aren't vacant positions. Those are uh, anticipated after people retire or leave and your ability and your need over that next period of uh, five years to fill those positions, correct? I have to replace those just to stay yeah. with what we're able to do today. Right. No, I, I just wanted understanding if they were currently vacant or not. That, so oh, that's no, 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 no. Those are people you. who are on board today. Sorry. Yeah. I appreciate that. So let me ask you this. The low-income tax clinics provide um, critical services to working taxpayers that are uh, unable to hire representatives to advocate on their behalf uh, in addressing their federal tax disputes. Um, while there are many in my home state that could benefit from these services, the last of these clinics, unfortunately, closed in Nevada. And so um, my question to you is, can increased funding for the IRS help to ensure broad accessibility to low-income tax clinics to all eligible taxpayers in states like Nevada and hopefully open up these clinics uh, to uh, service Nevadans? I'm not aware that the last clinic in Nevada closed, but I will look into that. But we need appropriated funding for the clinics. I'm a tremendous supporter of the clinics and have done a tremendous amount of Zoom interactions with clinics all around the country. One of the benefits of Zoom is the ability to do that. Um, but we will look into it. But the low-income taxpayer clinics are um, critical to the operations of the Internal Revenue Service. They are in the communities that we need to operate and the IRS could not effectively do tax administration, particularly in these communities, without LITCs, without the VITA sites, without tax counseling for the elderly. It's a critical function, and that's why, in part, the IRS is involved in um, the operations, if you will, of these, these programs. I agree. And Thank Congress you. funds we them. We look forward to working with you. And please let us know your needs, because uh, for the very reasons that you talked about, they are critical services. Let, let me jump to another topic, tax scams. Um, is an area that I worked on as a former attorney general, worked with uh, IRS enforcement. They were just incredible in helping us address the tax scams that we see across the country. My question to you is, what are you seeing? And uh, with the limited amount of resources now and the struggles you're having with the staffing, um, uh, uh, how are you addressing those needs to really educate the public on the types of scams that are out there so that they can uh, also uh, beware and prevent uh, becoming victims. Our partner in the tax scam world, if you will, is Treasury Inspector General for Tax Administration, TIGTA. And like us, they're very aggressive. Um, I, I, we do run undercover operations. Uh, I think that's pretty well known. I'm not saying something that's not otherwise public. And uh, we do a lot of outreach, local. Every local office of the IRS is engaged in outreach. The majority of these scams you know, that we see tend to go to um, underserved, more vulnerable communities. And um, we are very active in those communities together with community groups trying to focus on what they are. Uh, we try to get on the cutting edge. You know, With the EIPs, three rounds of EIPs, round one, two, and three, we saw the scams with that increase significantly. Um, but we did not reduce resources 
in sort of, if you will, um, oversight of the scam type of operations at all. We did not pause any interactions during the pandemic. And, you know, we have to make certain decisions and, and in priority decisions, but certainly that's a huge priority. And we've maintained, excuse me, vigilance. That's great to hear. Commissioner, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Hassan. Well, thank you, Ranking Member Crapo, uh, and thank you, Commissioner, for your work and for testifying today. And before turning to my questions, I would like to emphasize, uh, as a number of my colleagues have, the importance of the IRS prioritizing smooth delivery of the child tax credit starting in July. Based on issues with rollouts of other programs over the past years, IRS really needs to ensure that it's able to deliver these benefits in a timely way. Uh, Commissioner, granted staters continue to contact my office about the backlog of unprocessed 2019 and 2020 tax returns, which have delayed tax refunds for families who need economic assistance and cash flow. My office has also been contacted by constituents who tell us that they are going to be denied a mortgage because the mortgage company cannot verify their information with the IRS. These constituents submitted their tax return months ago, and now they're worried that they'll be unable to buy their house or lose their deposit. At our April hearing on the filing season, you committed to clearing the backlog this summer by dedicating more employee hours to processing returns. Can you update us on the IRS's progress since April in clearing the backlog? And when you think, when in this summer uh, will you have the backlog cleared? At that hearing, I said that we would do it within 60 days, and I think I may have indicated that might have been a, a lawyer answer given the, the curve of right. reducing the volume. Um, we, have every, we have processed every return received at this point before January 1, 2021. Okay. So every return received during 2020, and, and a lot of those were prior year returns, not just 19, but you know, 16, 17, yep. 18, there are people who catch up, if you will. But we, um, we caught up, and we are very proud of that. We also have caught up on our mail, you know, the terminology mail backlog. Right. All mail is now being opened within a week of receipt. Some is being opened within two weeks of receipt. Our four mail processing centers, Austin, Fresno, Kansas City, and Ogden, are operating at full speed. We last week received 1.2 million pieces of mail. We tend to receive between one and one and a half million, right. and we are current in our operations on opening the mail. Um, our error resolution service, where some of your and I, and I would like if we yeah. can coordinate a call maybe um, later today or this week or something um, to discuss the one of the issues you discussed yeah. and maybe we can provide some assistance. But um, error resolution system, uh, we currently have about 9.4 million returns in that process. The five top reasons that the issues are being called out is people are having difficulty, our difficulty reconciling what they say they received in EIP one and two with the return recovery rebate. We have people who um, used 2019 for their EITC, and we need to verify that so it's not an automated process that gets called out. Uh, we have people where the additional child tax credit does not match what we have as the ACTC. Yep. We have math verification issues, and uh, also we have a tremendous amount of folks who failed to file the Form 8962 for the advanced premium tax credit and interestingly, the private software even directs you to provide that form. So we're not able to process. Right. Those are the top five, okay. which leads to 9.4 million. Yeah. We are operating at full capacity to get those taken care well, of. Well, then I would look forward to following up with your yeah, office on, on these particular issues because we've got people who are obviously yep. needing to confirm their information so that they can buy a home, for instance. Yep. So let's move on to a, a topic that I asked you for the record in April. The American Rescue Plan contained my bipartisan bill with Senator Braun to provide assistance through the employee retention tax credit to new businesses that were started during the pandemic. Pandemic. Startups will be eligible to receive this assistance beginning in July. It's obviously crucial that the IRS issue guidance as soon as possible so that new businesses are able to quickly access this assistance next month. When will the IRS issue updated guidance for the employee retention tax credit? Yeah, twofold. Let me say that the um, response to your questions for the record, and I, I might yeah. have made this comment earlier, um, they are in clearance and, you know, we all would have hoped that you would have received them timely. It's not, we are backed up on a lot of different things, but yep. we're, we're very respectful and try to get those out as quickly as possible. 
but they are done and in clearance and they're outside of our building. So, so let's well. just get to the issue though. We've got businesses that started during the pandemic that need the guidance about how they can claim the employee retention tax credit. We, so we, sh we should get that out. I have to give you a lawyer term and I apologize and you can call me on it promptly. Okay. Um, you know, we're working as hard as we can. I do, and I do have, and it's in the response to you on the statistics of what we've received and where we are and how we're processing. Okay. And they're, I think they're just looking for guidance, right? Because they're trying to decide whether they're hiring, who they can yep. get a credit for, what their cash flow is going to look I like. I come right? from that community. So yeah, I know you do. I know. Um, I am almost out of time, so I am just going to uh, say that. Uh, I am encouraged that your 2022 budget request mentions the IRS's plan to retire and decommission its legacy systems, including those that use antiquated programming uh, languages. It's something I've been really focused on, on um, the Homeland Security, uh, the Emerging Threats and Spending Oversight Subcommittee of Homeland Security, and I'll look forward uh, to learning more about your progress there. Thank you. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Hassan. Uh, we have a number of, we have two votes underway right now, Commissioner, which is why you uh, <laughs> see. Uh, I didn't take it personally. You know. <laughs> <laughs> well, you said a little difficult here. I'm not aware of any senators who are back from the vote yet. Are there any, if, if there are any remotely, would you speak up? And I, I am available for one-on-ones with members and staff and Understood. I, we do expect a couple more are on their way. And uh, so I will ask a couple of questions that I didn't get to ask you during my first round until one of them gets back. And Commissioner, what I wanted to do is to go through with you uh, some of the tax gap information. As, as you know, I've sent you two letters on it, and we've already talked about the fact that, that you're in the process of getting those back. We got one yesterday, but it didn't uh, really provide the kind of detail that I was asking for. So I'd like to ask you to follow up uh, with, with more detail on what I asked in the, my May 10th letter about the tax gap. And let me get into what that is right now. When you testified earlier before the committee, uh, you estimated, uh, if I recall correctly, that the gap could be as high as a trillion dollars. Does that? Let, let me say that your letter, and I think you see my response to your letter, because um, you made yeah. comments about how others said I said it is a number. And my, that's why I put the quote in there of what I said is, yeah. you know, right? And so you, you had that right. But yes, trillion dollars was the number that uh, got picked up. All right. Now I see Senator Warren's back. Senator Warren, I'm just going to finish a statement here. And, and, and then I'll, I won't ask you to respond to this right now, but I would like you to respond back more, with more clarity. Uh, I, I'm, when you testified before us, you, you mentioned uh, that some of the reasons for the increase in the, the $441 billion tax gap estimate that was 10 years ago uh, was inflation, cryptocurrency, and you in, and at that time you indicated unreported or concealed income offshore and in pass-through entities. Uh, and I just wanted you, and I, I'd like to ask you, not now, but I'd like to ask you to, to parse out how you get to that trillion dollar figure in terms of where are we losing the collections that uh, of lawfully due taxes so that we can have a better idea about how we can assist you in getting those taxes collected. Certainly. Uh, Senator Warren. Thank you, Mr. Acting Chairman. And I agree with that question. It's a good question. Uh, we should do that. So. Thank you. A, a decade of budget cuts have hollowed out the IRS, so it just doesn't have the resources to go after wealthy tax cheats. And that's why I've introduced the Restoring the IRS Act to provide $31.5 billion in mandatory annual funding to allow the IRS to fairly enforce the tax code, to modernize its IT systems, and to improve taxpayer services. I am glad that President Biden and you, Commissioner Reddick, agree with me on the importance of making big investments in the IRS. But it is crucial to make sure that this money is going toward making our tax enforcement fairer, not reinforcing inequities like the racial wealth gap. So, Commissioner Redding, what data and analysis has the IRS developed on how its enforcement activities 
affect low-income black Americans? Treasury uh, Office of Tax Policy and Office of Tax Analysis are the ones that handle that. IRS is the tax administration agency, if you will. So we provide data to Treasury. I, I can say that Treasury has multiple working groups in this space. And um, I think, you know, the appropriate thing would be to have Treasury interact with you and give you a heads up on, on really what they're, what they're looking at, what they have looked at, data they've received. But the IRS itself does not collect data with respect to um, race, as you know. Okay, so you're not collecting race data right now. Uh, you know, I was glad to see President Biden issue an executive order on racial equity back in January, including a call for more data. But I want to see some concrete actions coming out of it, and that includes concrete actions at the IRS. This is important because the IRS doesn't just mechanically enforce our tax rules. The IRS has significant discretion. For instance, when it comes to audits, research shows that the IRS disproportionately targets poor black communities in the South for audits. We also know that an estimated 20% of eligible taxpayers don't receive the earned income tax credit, which provides crucial support to low-income working families. Likely, many of these families not getting this lifeline are families of color, uh, but we need more analysis to know for sure what's happening. So, Commissioner Reddick, let me ask, will you commit the IRS to conducting a thorough analysis of the racial impacts of IRS services and enforcement activities? And I think I can say, one, I, I need to dispute your first um, comment. I think the data is contrary to that, but we can go into that in another what, time. The data are contrary to what? About that we disproportionately look at lower income taxpayers or people of color, and the data is contrary to that. So it, it is not the case? I, I thought your data showed that I there would, are I more would. audits in poor areas in the South than there are, for example, of rich people in the North. The IRS, the only lower income individuals audited by the Internal Revenue Service are with respect to the earned income tax credit, which is about a 1.1% rate. And the reason that we even look in that direction, we have a $17.4 billion improper payment rate there. The only reason we look in that is because of IPERA, we're required to report an improper payment rate. And our RAS group, our research group, are the ones that come up with what that is. And they require us essentially to have a 1% audit rate for them to be able to extrapolate off of that to what, a, well, what it would be. Fair, fair enough on what may be the reason for the audit. But I guess the question, let me just go back to the question that matters the most to me. And that is, will you commit the IRS to conducting thorough analyses of the racial impacts of IRS services and enforcement activities. And I'll, I'll, I'll come back to my original comment, which is Treasury is doing that. So you think Treasury is so collecting enough I'm a data? I'm Bureau of you Treasury. Have, you have no more data collection responsibilities or opportunities? Is that what no, you're saying to me? I'm a, not at all. I'm a Bureau of Treasury. I report to the Secretary, and we work with Treasury, and they have the economists and others who do this type of work. So, so they we are, are working the ones with who them. will decide that you collect these data or not? Well, you'll know. Well, I'm assuming Treasury would make all the information public, and if not, you know, maybe you ask. Well, uh, the but, question correct. I'm asking is, though, are you collecting these data so that we can do the analysis? Well, we don't have necessary? race data. That, that's my point. So... Are you committed to providing the kind of data collection that you can to be able to study the racial impact of the decisions you make? With what we're doing, we give data to Treasury, and Treasury gets other data, and then their Office of Tax Analysis matches that. And I think, I don't mean to play semantics with you because it might sound like that, but it's, that's where the work is being done. And there is a significant effort. There are a lot of people looking at this within the administration, including the IRS. We're working with Treasury on this. I so, just want the, so the answer is yes. to be a good partner in this. Um, you know, the, the, the paper I was talking about earlier found that the IRS disproportionately audits poor black communities in the South. It was written by a former IRS economist in 2019. And if this is what a former IRS employee can show with existing publicly available data... 
It seems to me that the IRS both can and should deploy its own resources to examine racial inequities in its enforcement and other activities and then move to address those inequities. You know, I believe in data and armed with better data, a revitalized IRS can make sure that it is pursuing its audits fairly and that expanded tax credits and taxpayer services are reaching the American families that most need the help. And I hope we can be partners in that. I share your concern. And I think as we've indicated on the phone, look forward to ongoing communications with you in this space. I do believe that when people write articles, they should write it on actual data, that everybody is invited to look at our 2019 and our 2020 data books that have the actual numbers in there. If you look at 2019 data book, page 34, table 17A, it breaks out exactly the numbers there, and you will see. The, my, if I will, if I can go on briefly one more moment. It's, it's up to the chairman. Briefly, <laughs> please. Yeah, I apologize, but, but quite quickly, um, when we look at what is usually, loosely referred to as the heat map on EITC um, examinations, if you will, which are correspondence examinations where we ask people, did this child reside with you for six months? We look at it, um, and we don't have race data, but I'm, I'm not discounting what you're saying, and I don't want anybody to think that the IRS is insensitive to this issue. I am not, and we are not. But also, when we look at a heat map, personally, we look at it from the perspective of we need to do more outreach and be more on the ground in these communities, and we need to make sure that people know what they are eligible for and to get them the payments that we all want them to get. Well, And our people live in these communities. Mr. Commissioner, I, I understand. I just hope that on the ground does not mean more audits. And when I look at what a former IRS commissioner or employee has put together with existing publicly available data, I am deeply troubled by the reports there, and I hope that the IRS is not part of the problem, but part of the solution. Page 34. And we need to we'll take a look. Thank you. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. Next is Senator Young. Are you with us, Senator Young? Can you see me, Chairman? Not yet. Well, I hear you. Okay, here we go. Okay. I think I am. All right, we can see you now. Okay. Uh, Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Commissioner, in your last hearing in April, You testified that the IRS was up to date on opening its mail. However, that very same day, a taxpayer advocate service representative informed my staff that the processing center in Kansas City was still opening mail from June 2020. Now, my Hoosier constituents continue to be told by the Internal Revenue Service employees that the IRS is currently opening and processing mail from July 2020. What's going on here? That's false. The information you're getting from the Taxpayer Advocate Service is not accurate. I would encourage you, if you or your people, and this goes to all the members, get information that doesn't make sense to you, please reach out to me. Most of you have my cell phone. My cell phone's available to all of you. We'll schedule one-on-one meetings with you. The IRS has four mail services And those mail services are processing mail currently within days of receipt. So whatever information the taxpayer advocate or local taxpayer advocate is getting to you, they don't have the current information. And I can tell you, we have four services. Austin is opening mail. As of May 29, was opening mail from May 24, received. Fresno, on May 29, opening mail received May 28. Kansas City, on May 29, opening mail received May 24. Ogden, on May 29, opening mail received... May 28. We receive between 1 and 1.5 million pieces of mail a week. We process all the mail within a week of receipt. So I apologize if the information is not accurate, but my request, sir, would be to please reach out to me. I will indeed. Um, uh, I'm going to get to the bottom of this on behalf of my Hoosier constituents, and and, um, I thank you for addressing that, sir. It is curious to me, it's peculiar that the Taxpayer Advocate Service would be so wrong so consistently. 
if this is a it has been a problem, and if indeed this is a matter of conviction for you, as it uh, seems to be, <laughs> um, have you had dialogue with them to to uh, ensure that their discrepancies and their inaccuracies uh, can be remedied? They'd have the no reason to promulgate inaccurate information, presumably. The taxpayer advocate is thoroughly engaged with every facet of the Internal Revenue Service. And as you would imagine, the, uh, the taxpayer advocate herself is significantly engaged with our processing centers and, and the rest and the wage and investment, which is where all the processing happens. So um, what gets into the field for taxpayer advocate in the local offices, um, I'm unaware of. But I am aware that uh, they do have the information. And I'm not sure when your folks got that information. But I can tell you, and I would look forward to the opportunity to talk to you on the phone, maybe that we could get additional information and figure out how that happened. But um, I can tell you that we are current, and this didn't just happen yesterday. We received that information in April, again, the same day you testified uh, yep. before this hearing. So um, we're going to have to get clarity on this. Uh, you, you indicated that the Taxpayer Advocate Service uh, uh, has visibility in, into all aspects, but it's not getting uh, some of that information is not finding its way into the field. That would be my impression. I'm, I'm, you know, they're an independent operation within the Internal Revenue Service, so I don't know how their information flows. But, um, you know, they, they want to get the right information to you and your people as well. We're, we're all in trying to make everything as best possible for taxpayers, for members of Congress, for your staff and whatnot. And so, you know, again, I would appreciate the opportunity that we follow up. And, and I would encourage the members to interact directly with the taxpayer advocate herself. Um, you know, interact with me and separately, you know, interact with her. Okay. Uh, uh, would, would, would you, sir, uh, uh, or a member of your team follow up with the IRS Processing Center in Kansas City uh, just, just to ensure that nothing's been overlooked with respect to uh, uh, the opening of mail and outstanding paper returns from 2019? The 2019 returns are current, and it, referring to Kansas City, if you're referring to the Error Resolution Service, which is housed in Kansas City, that's a separate issue from the mail. And I may have indicated earlier that in ERS, currently we have about 9.4 million um, individual returns, and that was a May 28 date, and that the majority of those were pulled out for one of five reasons, which is reconciliation of return recovery rebate, which is the EIP reconciliation, additional child tax credit, math verifications, uh, missing form 8962 and whatnot, but we can give you specifics. But that may be a separate issue than physical mail. Physical mail is current. In the ERS, what we're trying to do is to work with the taxpayers and we need additional information to free those up. And if those items were missing on the return processing, they cannot be automatically processed and it gets kicked out to manual. And the manual process is to verify and to reconcile the issues that were there. And I, I'd, I'd appreciate the opportunity maybe that we walk you through that with uh, some of the uh, other people. Well, I'm, I, I, I'm grateful. I'm going to take you up on that opportunity. Uh, you, Mr. Commissioner, and, and my office, and if necessary, the Taxpayer Advocate Service uh, will we'll get some answers for my constituents uh, because um, they're being told that their paper 19, 2019 returns haven't even been opened or processed yet. That's the bottom line. And yeah, also, this is a, this, yes. when, we t when we talk one-on-one, -on -one, if, uh, if your folks could be prepared, assuming you have the authority, the authorizations to give us some specific information, that would help. If, if we're lacking in any authorizations, we will right, uh, we'll right. seek them, sir. That was okay. a heads up to try to get that before the call because a lot of things we can resolve when we have that call. Thank you, sir. Um, lastly, and uh, we'll keep this one tight. We need to right wrap now, up pretty quickly. Okay, about half of the U.S. population over the age of 12 is fully vaccinated against COVID-19, and almost 90% of vulnerable seniors have received at least one dose. Now that Americans have broad access to COVID-19 vaccines, how's the IRS planning to get employees back in the office and um, reopen? Uh, those in the field taxpayer assistance centers to help more Americans resolve uh, their their uh, their tax troubles. And if you could be a brief, commission. we we expect to reopen any closed centers that we have staffing for promptly, 
and the president's budget provides staffing for us to actually reopen all centers, which would be significant. All right, thank you. And uh, next will be Senator Daines, followed by Senator Whitehouse. Senator Daines. Great, thanks, Mr. Chairman. Thanks, Mr. Reddick, for being here. I want to start by joining Ranking Member Crapo and others in expressing my shock regarding the leak of individual IRS tax data in the ProPublica article published just this morning to see 15 years worth of confidential individual and business data leaked is most concerning, particularly at a time when the administration is proposing a massive increase in the amount of data the IRS would collect from individuals and businesses. I'm very glad to hear you're investigating the source of the leak. We will prosecute any violation of law in this instance. Absolutely. This violation of individual privacy and confidentiality could easily happen to ordinary Americans and small businesses, and that is what concerns me probably more than anything else. So thank you. Turning to my questions, we had a hearing earlier this year on the tax gap, at which witnesses spoke about how to close it and examine whether President Biden's proposals were realistic. Congressional Budget Office projects that increasing IRS funding by $40 billion dollars would net $63 billion in increased revenue, but the Biden administration estimates that $80 billion in funding would produce an additional $637 billion in net additional revenue. Commissioner Reddick, can you explain why there might be such a really a massive difference between the administration's revenue collection estimate and the estimate of CBLs? The administration's estimate was performed by the Office of Tax Analysis within Treasury, which are essentially their career economists. And, and, you know, as you were commenting, I was thinking, you know, on the outside, what we used to try to do is get all the experts in a room and have them work together and figure out uh, who's on target. Those, the, the IRS is not involved in, um, you know, forecasting what we can recover. Um, we go after everything to the best of our abilities, which includes, you know, funding, modernization, staffing, training, and the rest. And uh, we would look forward to the opportunity to do so. We will recover as much as we possibly can, both from enhanced taxpayer services, uh, relationships, communications, and whatnot, as well as enforcement, which I mentioned earlier. Um, I'm a huge advocate, and for almost 40 years now, inside and outside, have said that in enforcement supports compliant taxpayers. And similarly, you know, we need to not be um, examining taxpayers that we should not be. We need to lessen the burden on taxpayers and take the resources we do have and focus them appropriately. And I think that uh, with the oversight of this committee and other committees in Congress, we have the ability to do so. I do see all of this as an opportunity for collectively us to provide enhanced tax administration to the people of this country at a level, nature, and quality that they deserve. I think we're close to that. And I think that um, you know, the, I, I understand and share the bipartisan look that the IRS should collect the fair amount of tax from taxpayers, and it should not um, burden and unduly burden taxpayers, and that we should do the best we can. And I, I can tell you from being on the inside, the employees um, think like I do, universally. Yeah, well, it's, it, it, it's a thoughtful answer. Uh, uh, and I... I, just to follow up on that, uh, former IRS Commissioner Koskinen, he recently stated that it's not sure that the IRS could use $80 billion effectively. Uh, do you disagree with that statement? And if so, is there a dollar amount that you think would be about the right amount that the IRS could, could basically digest and, and use effectively? The IRS, yeah. I've indicated earlier, we actually months ago started working on uh, our workforce plans, if you will, moving forward, which include modernization. Um, just the modernization side of the house alone uh, could use a substantial amount of money. I think former Commissioner Rosati recently mentioned that what we spend about two to two and a half billion dollars on in terms of modernization, the uh, largest banks of the world that have a fraction of the information we do spend 10 to 12 billion dollars per year, and we're doing between two and 2.7 billion total and so, you know, the modernization side of the house could use a lot of help, and that helps both compliant taxpayers and helps us focus uh, appropriately on the, um, you know, compliance-challenged taxpayers. But at the appropriate time, I look forward to coming up and either in front of the committee or our folks briefing staff of the committee of what we see as the workforce plan. And uh, we've put a lot of effort into it. 
Um, you know, I will say, let me, let me go back to the EIPs, a comment. We worked really hard on those. That was a new line of work for us. Um, we didn't always get it right, but we, we, to the extent we made mistakes, it was because we were trying our best. Uh, we are here trying our best as well. And I hope that ultimately Congress and history looks at the IRS that in a very difficult environment, uh, meaning pandemic and otherwise, um, the people of the IRS performed admirably. And, yeah, you know, and, and people can say what they want as to me, but the respect for our employees, I think, is uh, among the highest of any federal agency. But back to your earlier point, I do, I am concerned that on the enforcement that we might present undue burdens on law-abiding businesses. Yep. And I'm not sure that this will actually produce the amount of revenue the administration believes it will. And then just last, it's going to be quick because I'm over. Can you tell me what steps the IRS would take to make sure it's not putting undue burden on small businesses, you know, that are paying their taxes, right, and so forth, as part of their enhanced uh, enforcement efforts? Yeah, I made a comment earlier. I come from a small business family. Basically, my dad had a truck. Um, I was participant in small businesses when I was on the outside before I got to the Internal Revenue Service. I have a very strong line of sight into um, small business community, as well as supporting them with appropriate services. Often they're challenged. They don't have the resources. Their effort is to try to get income, and less of an effort goes into sort of, on the outside, I used to refer to as the back end of the house, you know, the accounting and whatnot. Um, part of our job at IRS is to issue clear, timely meaningful guidance in, in terms that people can understand. It's not appropriate to point to a 700-page regulation, maybe on irs.gov, maybe not, and say, well, we told you so. Um, but the outreach to the small business communities will be enhanced under the president's um, proposals. And um, certainly, I have a strong focus. And other people in the IRS share that. And I've said numerous times today, you know, I have 17-month runway. But uh, people in the IRS share the concerns that I have. and supporting the small business community and not burdening the small business community, particularly during a pandemic, I think should be important for every American. Yeah. Commissioner Reddick, thanks for your thoughtful answers. Appreciate it. Thank you. And next is Senator Whitehouse. Are you with us? Thank yes, I am, uh, Chairman. Thank you very much. And thanks, uh, Commissioner, for being back with us again. Um, when you were before us uh, earlier, you said that money stashed in foreign accounts could be part of why the tax gap may be more than twice as large as official IRS estimates. Um, there's been some skepticism expressed about that in the committee. I just wanted to give you a chance to add any clarification or amplification and uh, whether or not you still stand by the point that you made. Still stand by the point I made. Our director of research uh, separately testified in a House hearing and built through the same blocks. And before he got to illegal source income, the transcript is out there. Before he got to illegal source income, his comment was that the comments of the commissioner are not unreasonable. And um, I do stand by that. And the, you know, Good. we don't know what we don't know, but these are educated guesses. Yeah. So the Treasury Inspector General for Tax Administration noted at a hearing uh, that the IRS has taken virtually no compliance actions to meaningfully enforce the Foreign Account Tax Compliance Act. Um, <clears throat> what can we do to help? improve that record? Are there resources or uh, regulate? What, what focus do we need to do to- A Absolutely. That? FATCA was um, passed with the idea that the you know, U.S. government, IRS, receive data with respect to foreign accounts uh, for individuals throughout the world. And unfortunately, we did not get the resources to implement a modernization of our systems to be able to appropriately use the data that we receive under FATCA and uh, part of the president's budget provides us with the resources to modernize our systems to get there. And uh, I think it could be instrumental what we might find, um, as well as, you know, if we find out that there's no there there, that would also be instrumental. And I think everybody yeah. should support that effort. So is that a, do you know if that's a separate line item in the president's budget proposal or do will we have to go in to break it out? Um, I will find it Question for you. for the record for somebody on your team yeah. to let us know. Yeah. We'll get that if, for you. You know, whatever it's we critical. can do to break out the elements of, of FATCA enforcement. So um, on to kleptocracy, the president just issued a memorandum on establishing the fight against corruption as a core United States national security interest. Um, we have just um, passed good uh, beneficial ownership uh, disclosure laws. Are you... Um, 
comfortable with the treasury process and the IRS uh, aspects of implementing that rule, any report you can give, it's really important the treasury, DOJ, and IRS all be happy with where we are, are you? The, the IRS will do the best that it can with the resources that it receives to implement um, every legislation that impacts um, areas that are of the IRS's uh, domain. And so as to, um, I am a believer in transparency and, you know, full disclosure and all the rest. And, um, you know, I can confirm and commit to the fact that we will do our best and certainly Treasury. And are you comfortable that you're being heard in the regulatory process of developing the uh, rules to enforce and implement the legislation? We have weekly, uh, biweekly, excuse me, biweekly meetings with the uh, Office of Tax Policy at Treasury that okay. um, not only myself, but our leadership team and council um, are engaged in. So, yes. Okay. Last question, and you're welcome to take this one for the record. Um, it relates to 501c4s. You answered um, just a few days ago a question um, that I had about the number of referrals that the IRS has made to the Department of Justice for investigations involving nonprofit organizations. There are about 200 over the last five or six years. Um, could you? Again, you can take this for the record. I'd like to know if uh, any of those, and if so, how many of those involved uh, potential false statements made by nonprofits regarding political activity. And I'd also like to know if you're aware of whether any of them were actually were taken to prosecution, uh, what the record was of them being taken up over at DOJ. Would you be able to get me that info? Um, well, you know, with appropriate safeguards, we'll reach out to DOJ and try to get the information for you. Great. At this point, I think I'm just looking for numbers, so there shouldn't be any problem with it. How many of the 200 involved uh, potential false statements about political activity, uh, and how many were actually taken up by DOJ of the 200? It's not always so easy for us to get information when the lawyers get involved, but I say that <laughs> being a lawyer, but... Understood. That's why I'm making it a question for the record. Thank you very much. Thank my, my Thanks, colleague. Chairman. Thank, thank you. Um, Commissioner, we're winding down here for a long um, morning, and just, just a couple of comments. First, with respect to tax enforcement, which has come up repeatedly over the course of the morning, and I know this doesn't surprise you, my interest is making sure that this is not just another chapter in the tale of two tax codes in America. When a nurse, a nurse is sure to owe a penalty if her W-2 doesn't match her return, a millionaire can arrange their assets through a sophisticated, complex web of partnerships and can abuse the system with no risk of detection. That is the status quo today. And that's what I want to change. So we're going to be talking to you more about enforcement. And you said you'd get us some information with respect uh, uh, to your targets. But that is what I'm really concerned about. And it undergirds my whole view with respect to the tax code uh, in America. Uh, then with respect to, again, the ProPublica information uh, today, and I've been asked about this repeatedly already. <clears throat> I want to understood <clears throat> that the IRS has a responsibility to protect taxpayer data, and you've confirmed this morning that uh, this matter is being investigated. And then from the policy side, the big picture is this data shows that the country's wealthiest who profited immensely during the pandemic have not been paying their fair share. And they can essentially line up their lawyers and accountants and their professionals and can defer and postpone and put off paying and to a great extent live off money borrowed against their assets while not paying any taxes for very long periods of time. And the nurses and firefighters I represent in Oregon can't play those games. They play, pay their taxes with every paycheck. So I'm just going to close 
<clears throat> we'll be talking with you uh, and others in the future because I'm going to have a proposal to fix this broken uh, system and have it ready to be released again. It released uh, soon. With that, the committee uh, also notes that questions for the record have got to be delivered uh, next Tuesday. by next Tuesday, a week from today. With that, the committee is adjourned.